Hello and welcome to the Big League Show. As always, I'm Connor Somerville, joined by Aiden Siliphant, and today it's game day. We're back. NHL returns, and in order to kick off the season on a good note, we thought we'd bring in the one man who probably doesn't want the season to start because he's a fan of the Ottawa Senators. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the new 21-year-old as of Monday, happy belated birthday, Mr. Nicholas Robinson. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the birthday wish, and uh, I think you hit the nail on the head pretty well there. You know, hockey season, bittersweet coming back, but you know, we're looking forward. It's been 10 months since I've seen a Suns game, so... Looking forward that to it. Very true. You got to be excited. It's, a, it's, it's an exciting time to be a Senators fan. You know, they got all these young pieces, and you know the expectations aren't very high for them. So I'm sure you're just happy that hockey's back. Yeah, things are looking on the upswing for sure, and I, I think the season will be a bit more exciting than the past two tankathons that we've had. So th- <laughs> this will be good, I think at least. I hope. Well, we'll talk some sense later because Eugene was Eugene again. Um, we'll get into that, but we want to start off our conversation about you, as we always do. And if you've ever watched our show, you'll know that the first question that we always ask our guests is the same thing. Uh, and that is, what is your first memory of sports? And what is your first memory of sport media? All right, good question. Um, I would say I, my first memory of sports was playing soccer as a kid in general. That's like my personal memory when it comes to sports. I would say in terms of watching sports, I really didn't start to watch any sports until about 2007. I was a bit later than some people, and that was when the Senators went on a Stanley Cup run and went to the finals that year against the Anaheim Ducks, and that's what really made me the sports fan I am today. Um, sport media... Again, that's another difficult one for me because I never really paid attention to the media. Uh, sport media was never something I really wanted to do up until about 20 seconds, paying attention to commentators as a kid, especially somebody like Bob Cole. Um, that would be where all the good early memories for me came when it came when it comes to sport media. Huh, that's interesting. I, mean, I really didn't think that you'd be starting that late in terms of following sports and i guess you're in the same boat as a lot of people are uh in terms of not really thinking of sport media as a career until later in high school um but let's start with high school and start with your early life um what really first got you into sports and what really drew you to potentially pursuing a career in media um well i would say the biggest influence with sports was always my dad he pushed me to play hockey when i was a kid my mom pushed me to play soccer because um she's greek and that's the greek side of my family coming in you know she's more familiar with soccer probably pushing me to do it she used to coach me when i was a kid and then my dad threw me on skates for the first time when i was about six again probably a lot later than a lot of people started playing hockey but you know he always made a point of taking me to leaf games here even though neither of us are leaf fans Um, taking me to Blue Jays games. We went to quite a few Toronto Argonauts games as a kid. So that that would be where my early steps really came and what made me into what I am today. I was always a big sports fan, but it was never something I considered doing, uh, especially in a university program until it came later to high school. When did you discover the program then? And what sort of drew you to it potentially being something that you thought you could do as a career and pursue sport media as a potential university degree. Well, I I tell the story to a lot of people, actually, because, you know, a lot of people do find it interesting. You know, I got quite a few friends that, you know, I had a program like this for quite a while um, and stuff like that. But I actually applied to um, five universities or four universities back in January 2018. And uh, none were Ryerson. I applied to Western, Trent, Trent, Laurier and well, or Laurier and Queens, and they were all for business. I got into all of them. Business was what I wanted to do. It was what I studied in high school. I was pretty dead set on I wanted to become an accountant or something like that. It was what I wanted to do. It's what I studied for. Um, And it wasn't until after I sent the applications in and got accepted into everything that my mom sort of came back late in February and said, hey, I found this cool program at Ryerson. 
And um, she knew I was always a big sports fan. And her and my dad always thought, like, you know, I shared a pretty special connection with sports and loved the Senators. And I, my love for soccer at that time was really growing, too. And she said, hey, well, like, why don't you just apply here? We'll let you apply to a fifth uni um, and just see if you get in. So I wrote out the questions application for Ryerson, if you guys remember. I think that's been scrapped now. But back then, you had to fill out that couple of essay questions and even at one point sign up for an interview. So I just fired away the application, didn't think anything of it. I got accepted. And it was even before uh, Ryerson accepted me back and invited me to come interview that I was still pretty set on. Uh, I had accepted Laurier at that point to go to business, and that's what I wanted to do. Didn't think twice about it. And it wasn't until really my interview that my mind sort of started to change. So wait, you accepted Interesting. Laurier. Interesting. You accepted Laurier, but then you decided to come back. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, that's interesting. I don't think we've heard that one before. Yeah, I, I was really, really late in the game that I decided to go to Ryerson even then. So I went to my interview in April for Ryerson and got accepted a week later. Um, you know, I, I've i always been a pretty confident guy, and I walked out of the interview knowing that I had done pretty well. I was pretty proud with how I did and thought it went really well. And still thought on my way out, I was walking around the Ryerson campus with my mom that afternoon. And, you know, I, it just still didn't appeal to me, really. Um, the program sounded cool. I really didn't know much about it until right around the interview. I didn't really pay attention. Didn't know that there was any sort of broadcasting opportunities with uh, Rams Live or Spirit Live or anything like that. Um, you know, and it wasn't until I had accepted Laurier... And it was probably late, the last couple of weeks of May. And I think the deadline to accept Ryerson was June 1st. And my parents were actually the ones that said to me, Nick, I think you're making a mistake here. They actually sat me down. They said, I think we think you should consider Ryerson. Go for a year. Try it out. Sports is always something you've liked. And they thought I could do really well with it. And they sat me down. They told me, Go for a year, see how you like it. If not, we have no problem like sending you back to Laurier next year. Just go try it out. And I went, showed up first year, and you know, two and a half years later, I'm still here. Wow, that's crazy. It's a crazy journey. So you really yeah. wanted to do business? And... Yeah, business was always something I wanted to do. Even now, um, you know, I still plan on going into law school and writing my LSAT later this year, um, even when I graduate here. But I don't at all take for granted a lot of the skills that I've learned at Ryerson so far and this program's definitely taught me a lot and I've really enjoyed doing it and you know if someday it leads to a career in this field then I'd be more than happy to get into that but uh, you know I still have a lot of other things at play. So what do you want to do in the industry then? Um, well I knew when I accepted the one thing I always liked uh, and it comes back to what I mentioned earlier my connection watching Bob Cole growing up as a kid that I really liked uh, you know play by play in hockey and that was always something I paid attention to I wanted to know who the broadcasters were I had all my favorites all the guys I would watch hockey highlights not even to see the plays I just liked hearing the passion from announcers and that was always one thing that really stuck out to me about hockey and what I always loved about it even when I was little so that's what I wanted to do it's still I've gotten the opportunity to do it a few times for Rams live and that's been really fun and it's been a great challenge and I think I've improved a lot really even from year one to year two when I did uh, I think I did five games in year two and, you know, obviously haven't been able to do any this year, but I'm really looking forward to getting back and doing it at some point because I like the challenge and I feel like it's something I'm good at. Um, so that's it, obviously a shot in the dark because it's such a competitive industry. There's so few jobs available at high levels, but that's something I want to do. But other than that, it's, you know, use the knowledge here and maybe apply it somewhere where a lot of people don't tend to think like, in terms of the That's law. crazy. Uh, we'll talk about Rams Live in a second. Uh, first, I want to get a bit more info on your application stuff because I think you'll have an interesting opinion and sort of take on everything given the fact that Ryerson wasn't initially your first option uh, or initially the thing that you were wanting to pursue. Um, so what was that application process like for you? How much pressure did you find 
filling out everything was uh, who was your interviewer? We love finding who, out who that was. Uh, and how do you think the interview went? Well, so in terms of the application process, again, I never at any point really felt any pressure to do it. It was more so just a chore at that point for me. And I like, you know, I look back on that now and realize how silly it is looking back on it because I, I didn't care. I knew my, like, I just put down a couple of answers on the questions and ran it by my dad. He usually likes to go through all my stuff and um, he's good that way and always gives me some really good feedback And because he works in a field where he deals with a lot of um, writing and media and stuff like that. So, you know, him and I sort of like, I, I brainstormed with him a bit and then, you know, filed in or submitted the answers and um, to the essay stuff and didn't really think twice about it, like I said. And I showed up for my interview. It was with Donna Morrison. Another Donna. Um, nice. And I'm trying to think. Yes. She asked me a couple of questions, which I still laugh about my answers to. Um, she asked who I looked up to in the industry, if I had any sort of role models. And my answers were Pete Blackburn and DJ Bean. I don't know if you guys follow them. I know uh, Pete, Pete Blackburn. Blackburn gotten in a huge Twitter Bruins fan. <laughs> uh, Live World Juniors. Yeah, yeah have you? Okay. We, we go at it every once in a while. Yeah, and to hand over she was. Yeah. They always got the better of me. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so Pete Blackburn um, was one of them. And he runs a podcast brunch with DJ Bean, which is always what I listen to. And I looked up to those guys a lot because I really appreciated that they did and still do take a completely non-serious approach to a lot of life and sports in general. So um, I that was one of my answers, and she kind of gave me a funny look, like, who the heck are these guys? Like, wait, she obviously had never heard an answer quite like that before, and she asked me if I had any role models outside of school or, like, outside of life and stuff like that, and I answered Eric Carlson. <laughs> Which yeah. I look back and probably should have gone with like a more personal answer, like my mom or something like that. <laughs> but um, no, I look back on it now and realize that was a pretty silly interview. Um, but I did walk out pretty confidently and knew that uh, I had made a decent connection with her and was pretty felt pretty good about my chances about getting in. And, I think I had a very uh, similar question, off. and I'm pretty sure I said something like James Duffy. Um, That's a better so... answer. <laughs> well, answer. We both got in. So. Aurora, him and I are from the same oh. hometown. Yeah, that is true. Huh. So you're from Aurora. Is that where you live now, or are you in Ottawa? In Newmarket now. So Newmarket. that's just north okay. of Aurora. It's right beside each other. Um, hometown of Connor McDavid. That's usually what I have to tell people when I tell them I'm from Newmarket. <laughs> um, yeah, grew up in Aurora and now live in Newmarket. Interesting. I always thought you were out in like the East ontario sort of thing not necessarily i have absolutely no connection to ottawa whatsoever uh, in terms of family never had um funny enough now after years of being 10 years old and sort of asking my parents to move to ottawa because i fell in love with the senators uh my dad actually works out there full time now so that's uh that's sort of the funny connection so it's now i have a connection to ottawa but never did growing up so your dad doesn't commute every day i assume no, I he comes it. back home on weekends and lives out in Ottawa during the week. Okay, uh, yeah, that would be quite the commute. I think it's like five hours from Toronto to Ottawa. Yeah, it's, it's about four, four hours. hours a day. Yeah, yeah, I've <laughs> gone, I've gone up to see him. He just started back in the summer, so I've gone up to see him a couple of times already. And I've done the, uh, he'll stay over Sunday night and uh, leave here at around four in the morning and be in the office for nine a.m. So that's a, it's a pretty crazy commute, but I've done it with him now a couple of times, and yeah, it, it's not fun, but he likes it, so no power to him. He's a brave, brave man, because I could never do that. Uh, well, brave or stupid, one of the two. Probably a little bit. One of the two. Um, <laughs> let's dive into more on Ryerson and sort of your experience with Ryerson. So... We haven't asked this question in a while, but what's been your favorite course mm -hmm. so far uh, in sport media? Mm, I'm trying to think. That's a good question. I, man, I, I've really enjoyed, like, I know this is a bit of a cop-out. I've enjoyed quite a few of them just because it's not what I was expecting when I applied. None of what I've done so far is what I expected to do. I really liked some of the TV labs because it taught me stuff that it taught me a bunch of new skills, stuff that I never thought I would know how to do. I took um, 
Sport Media Graphics last semester, while that was online and not in the lab, and it was a lot different than you know some other people have had experiences with, I really enjoyed that because again, I learned something new. So I've always, that's been a big thing for me in this program. I came in here um, eventually and just decided that I wanted to soak up as much as I could. And I've been taking a wide range of things so that I could learn different skills. So anything that's been able to teach me new skills, I've really enjoyed, you know, some of the stuff we're forced to take like BSM and marketing. Um, I've enjoyed more than others because it's business and that's what I wanted to do yeah. originally. So I felt, you know, a bit more work ethic come on in those courses and I've been able to push myself in ways that I feel like others maybe haven't felt the desire to push themselves to do well in. So um, it's a bit of a cop out, but I've enjoyed a fair range of stuff. Just whatever teaches me something new. What's your take on... We haven't had that answer before. What? What's your take on online school this semester and the sport media classes in specific? Do you think that it's beneficial for us learning all this TV lab stuff on our own, essentially, like at home? And also that sport graphic course, how how did you find that having to learn all the Photoshop tutorials, I guess, kind of by yourself without a, a TA to help you in person? Yeah, it's it's been a huge adjustment, and not something any of us saw coming. I think it's all useful at the end of the day because it feels like we don't we don't know what the world's going to look like in a couple of years after the COVID nineteen pandemic, and the general feel with what we're being told at school and what we're seeing with our own eyes is that a lot of it's changing, a lot of it's shifting to. Um, a work from home type atmosphere. So at the end of the day, I think a lot of this could be useful because it, you know, just teaches us to work from home, forces us to be that bit more creative and adaptive with what's going on around us. Um, you know, the TV labs that we did third year, that was obviously a grind at times. Anytime you're staring at your computer for five, six hours on end, like it, it sucks. Like there's no other word for it. It's not easier. It's it, it's definitely not easier. That's the one thing I keep telling people, you know, I get adults asking me all the time, parents, friends, like, oh, how's school going and stuff like that? Maybe a bit easier with the online. It's the one thing I always tell them, it's not easier. It's way harder, in fact, I think. And it's been certainly a big adjustment, not having TAs there and not having that general face-to-face -face interaction with people. It definitely does make some of the work more challenging. But you know, this is the way that world is going so we're forced to adapt that's interesting because i found this semester or this past semester easier than i found in person stuff. i didn't find it easier at all maybe not no. easier i, I think, think done better. yeah that's maybe that's better way exactly that's what i was gonna say marks have gone up but i would say having to do the work i found it a lot harder even just finding motivation to do the work is, is hard because you have so many distractions being at home and you got like it's the motivation for me absolutely yeah Exactly, right? That's that's the motivation. And hopefully next semester, yeah, we're, so we're even more it. used to it and we can do better. So, And, you know, it, it, at times it just feels like something like this is not something I want to get used to, but that's the way the world's going, unfortunately, um, for better or worse. Yes, and speaking of the way the world's going, um, stay at home. Yeah. We're getting like 3K cases a day in Ontario. Uh, so... What? Yeah, yeah, it sucks, and let's not do that. Uh, let's try not to have, as the government's model projected, potentially 10k cases a day by February. Um, yeah, the funny thing for me up here in Newmarket is that so in sort of Newmarket Aurora, there's really only between 20, 30 cases a day. Like maybe that's like really high for us up here. Yet York Region is getting close to 300 a day because it's all sort of down in um, Markham. So while life for me, I walk around, I don't feel very concerned up here. I drive, you know, 10, 15 minutes down south towards Toronto and it feels very hectic all of a sudden. Yep. Uh, so stay in your homes and don't raid the Capitol building because that's not good either, uh, which... Man, we were doing a pod. We were doing the Thomas podcast last week as that was happening. Yeah, and I was just getting texts from my mom like, "You have to look at the news. This is insane." You know, I I went like, upstairs. Yeah, <laughs> I went upstairs after the podcast was done, and I think I told you like my parents are going to be watching CNN. They didn't have it on. They didn't know what happened. <laughs> they they had no idea what was going on. What? Yeah. 
I was shocked. Oh. I was shocked. Um, but then, yeah, we turned it on. It's craziness on. My, my dad's the big CNN fan in my house, so usually he has it on when he's here. But now that he's been working out in Ottawa during the week, you know, I don't have, like, I usually come upstairs and he's, he's got it on the TV already. He knows what's going on. I, I was the one that actually told him, and he was pretty stunned with how it turned out. But unfortunately, um, the way everything's gone in that country, it's not surprising. But depending on. Uh, who in sport media you ask, you know, an individual comes to mind, you know, maybe it's not a bad thing. The Capitol building got stormed, but um, we won't name anybody or delve into that. No, I don't we'll think. avoid that subject as <laughs> fast as we possibly can. Um, but yes, it's going to be an interesting couple weeks in the U.S., shall we say. But this is a sports podcast. This isn't a politics podcast for, sure. uh, for good reason, because sports debates don't mean anything as opposed to raiding a government building um so let's touch on some of the stuff you've done affiliated with ryerson but not with ryerson i guess no what am i saying some of the stuff you've done outside of classes affiliated with ryerson because we got to talk about rams live because as you mentioned earlier you've done a few broadcasts for them so i want to know what have you really enjoyed about rams live and how have you found the experience of hosting, doing live broadcasts during an actual game, which you can only prepare for doing pre-research and not necessarily write sort of a script in our on-air class? Well, first and foremost, I think the one thing that I'll tell you and anybody who's done a Rams live broadcast will tell you, like, for me, I've always been blown away by the professionalism of everybody. And that's the one thing that really... Um, stuck with me from the first time I did it. You know, my first Rams live broadcast came uh, in October of first year, and I went in to be an analyst for a women's hockey game. And, you know, obviously I'm showing up in my little suit and just sort of like shaking because I'm so nervous and stuff like that. But, you know, the professionalism and the atmosphere there just, you know, even though it's just students and you're all only separated by a couple of years in age, just there's that sense of unity and that feels really good when you're younger and trying to learn um, what to do. So that's that's been the best part of my experience, I think, is the professionalism. Um, on a personal note, you know, it's a challenge going from my broadcasting practice, which previously was, you know, maybe calling things when looking at the TV. I did that. I've done that a few times with my dad or um, my favorite thing to do, actually, and I still do it quite often, is I'll be playing NHL or FIFA on xbox with my friends and i'll do the uh play by play in the party chat for for the boys and they seem to always like that so that's pretty much all the pro uh practice i get outside of um actually doing a broadcast so it's a it's a lot different because there's a lot more preparation a lot more thought and you, you know you're actually creating something for a target audience at that point you gotta be captivating you've got to be professional you've got to be interesting and that's been a huge learning curve for me um going from just practice um into a real life real situation You're the first person in our year to do an on-air broadcast for rams live correct according to Tom, yeah, i think yeah. it was up there yeah i uh i sort of remember there was maybe a couple right around then i i was up there um definitely with one of them from what i remember i think thomas mentioned that last week mm -hmm. sort of watching the draw <laughs> yeah what uh so wait when did you do it when yeah. was your first uh i don't think there was anything specific that went into that because it did my bad there's a bit of a delay uh, uh october first year october first october year. first year was my first one Okay, I see. And what was that feeling, I guess, before you go on air? How were you feeling? Were you nervous? Uh, were you excited? What, what was going through your head at that point? Oh, pure nerves. I'm a pretty nervous guy. Um, you know, a lot of people can't tell that most of the time, but I'm an extremely shy person. I'm an extremely nervous person. I put a lot of pressure on myself to do well, um, whether it be in school, whether it be socially, whether it be, you know, just something like a Rams live broadcast. I put a lot of pressure on myself and um, you know, I look back on that now and I, I hate watching some of that tape again. I do have the tape of my analyst takes from that first time I did it. And I hate watching it because I, I can't look at the camera. I'm going, um, every five seconds. Like I was, you can see the nerves on my face when I do it, but you know, it makes it all that much more rewarding now a year on, 
um, two years on, when I look back on it to see how far I've come on a personal note and how big my learning curve has been when doing an online, uh, sorry, when doing an online broadcast now and doing any broadcast in general, I, I feel a lot more confident now. And, you know, all it takes is practice and practice, practice, practice. I wish they spent more time in sport media talking about how to deal with nerves uh, before or during broadcast, stuff like that. Because I think I am a, I have anxiety, uh, so I'm already a nervous person. But on top of doing like on-air stuff uh, or any social interaction, that is like up there. And I think I don't think I'm alone in this program uh, necessarily in terms of being nervous before going on air. Yeah, oh, I'm certainly uh, with I you. think like nobody would know that with how good you you are on air and with how much stuff you've done. So I think if they'd sort of given us some lessons or some kit tips or anything like that to sort of deal with it, I think would be very helpful. But I think the on air program's unbelievable. The on air class in in second year did give us a little bit of advice, but yeah, maybe and. I guess like we also did some interviewing with that class as well, or that was in journalism. Um, but yeah, I do agree with that. I think it's it's not uncommon for for anyone to be nervous. Like if you're not nervous before going on air in front of a large audience, like then you're not human. You know, you always have to have some nerves and some anxiety heading into it, and that ultimately makes it better, right? If you you don't want to be too calm, you want to have a little bit of energy building up and some uh, adrenaline and you want to get get hyped for it, it, it as, uh, as well. And I was very fortunate. Yeah, sort of the good. first time I did play by play, which was about a month there, maybe a couple of weeks after the first time I went on Rams Live as a as an analyst. I did play by play for the first time, which was you know that blew me out of the water. That uh, Brian Withers wanted me to come on and do that, and I was, you know, again the nerves were through the roof for that. But I was extremely fortunate that. Um, Clipper, who was a former uh, Ryerson women's hockey player and was doing Rams live um, for them at that point, she was she did um, the panel with me a couple of weeks prior, and then she was my color commentator for that game. And you know, she was obviously well versed and very experienced with Rams live and doing broadcasting work. And um, you know, just a couple of times I worked with her there, she was extremely welcoming to me and helped me a lot and made me feel a lot more comfortable. Um, doing that stuff. So you know, as long as you have people like that, um, I think that's important. And I would love to have that opportunity to try and, you know, do that next year for somebody. If we're back in person, back doing you know, broadcasts again, I would love to be that mentor figure and try and help out somebody who's in first year and dealing with those same sort of feelings that I once had. What would Which you do you prefer? Color or play by play? Sorry, it's all good. Oh, play by play all the way for me. Yeah, play by play all the way. Um, you know, I do like analyzing hockey in general, but I like doing that sort of in this sort of format almost. Like when you're just having a discussion with a couple of people, I do that uh, in a couple of radio shows. But uh, when it comes to actually being part of a broadcast, my connection has always been to play by play. And I love being the one that can sort of bring that energy and uh, bring my knowledge of the game in that way. So you, you right. talked about maybe That's being... Cool. Let's move on. Okay, you go. Move on, move on, move on. <laughs> this delay, How about man. you take off from the call for a second? Take off from the call for a second, jump back in, and hopefully that fixes it. All right, let, let's help. Um, All right, BRB. Because... No worries. All right, um, we're back. Hopefully this is better. Uh, we might have to do this a few times. <laughs> we will figure out a better solution in the future. Maybe it means not using Discord. Who knows? Um, but let's talk a bit more about the stuff that you've done not affiliated with Ryerson. Uh, I say not affiliated, but some of the stuff is sort of affiliated because you started it on Spiro Live. But let's start with something we've talked about with like a quarter of the people who are involved in the project. Um, which we'll get to everybody eventually. Uh, the Year 5 Collective, because there were a lot of you. We've Obviously, I mentioned talked about this at nauseum. Um, so I don't want to go too in-depth, but is there anything that really sort of stuck out to you about that experience and really putting together your own website with a bunch of your peers, and actually our peers, 
uh, when creating this project? Well, obviously, the Year 5 Collective sort of, you know, it's fallen off since. We've all sort of got our own stuff on our plate right now. But when we started that, it was just after first year. And um, that was sort of a lot of people's first taste in writing. That was my first taste in writing, actually going and um, researching and publishing stuff somewhere. So that was that was a big experience for me because it ultimately uh, gave me a bit of confidence um, in my ability to do that sort of stuff that vaulted me into different projects that I'm involved with now. But obviously, um, that was a cool experience because, again, it was working with all my friends in the program. And, you know, we all sort of had a good thing going where we bounced ideas off each other. Um, that's really been my only experience to date where I've written about soccer. So that's been something that was really cool to me and hopefully something I can do at some point down the road. But, um, you know, when you're working with friends like that, it can be both a challenge and a blessing. For me, it was it was good because I like bouncing ideas off of people and I like having um, conversations about how we can make some sort of engaging content. So did the Year 5 Collective sort of shoot your interest into potentially pursuing Sandshot and working with Fansided? Absolutely, it did. Um, I wrote a couple of Senators and hockey-based articles for the Year 5 Collective back then and published, and I felt really good about it at that point. So I actually sent um, two of them that I wrote for the Year 5 Collective off to Sunshot when I applied uh, just over a year ago now. And uh, they seem pretty impressed with it. And, uh, you know, ultimately now that's led to um, something I've been doing for a year now with Sunshot and with a focus on the Senators, which has always been cool for me. Yeah. Um, let's, I'm always interested to hear people's different experiences with Inside it because I feel it's, it's different, I think, with every sort of section of the website, depending on what you write about. Like, obviously, I write MLS, so very few people pay attention to it. Uh, whereas somebody who writes for editor and leaf like uh, Eric Crookshank, who we have to have on eventually, uh, might have a different experience because it's just a different environment. So how have you found the audience for your senator's writing? Have you found it being, have you found it being a good experience and ha- like an open acceptance by sense fans? Or has it been more, who is this guy? Why should we care about what he has to say? Well, it's been, uh, you know what? I would say it's been pleasantly surprising for me so far. Um, I didn't get that position expecting much. I was just thinking, okay, this is, at the end of the day, this is all going to go to like a portfolio at some point. It's something I can say I did. Um, and fan sided is a pretty reputable network and stuff like that. And it always looks good on a resume. That's sort of what I thought when I first applied. Again, it's sort of like Ryerson. I just went in with like the lowest expectation possible and um, told myself I was going to make the most of it. Um, so I will. I tell everybody this. I think that the Ottawa Senators get very underrated in terms of how passionate their fan base is um, because there is a lot of... Uh, if you're well-versed in Ottawa Senators Twitterverse or something like that, you know how much content there is out there. There's all sorts of people everywhere doing their own podcasts, um, starting their own writing networks, um, doing videos on YouTube. There's all sorts of stuff. And I think they can go head-to-head in terms of anybody um, in the NHL for qualities produ- quality content produced by the fans. So you know, being part of Sunshot, a site that was really left dormant, I would say, a couple of years ago, um, not reputable at all and it it was just mismanaged I I would say and I sort of hopped on at the right time where it was really on an upswing and you know the views that the page is getting now are much higher than what they were getting just over a year ago when I first came and that's been really good for me and I've gotten to work with some really good people there bounce ideas off some really good guys as well that are just trying to do the same thing as me they're trying to you know build a name for themselves and do what they can um Obviously, now I'm shifting more towards implementing some of my own personal things into what I write. So I've been doing a couple of graphics now a couple of times a week just to go with some of the skills that I've learned at Ryerson and apply that to sort of my writing. Just again, it's all creating that engagement. And that's a really important thing to me. But I would say in general with Sunshot, it's it's led to some pretty good opportunities for me so far and I've been pretty pleased with it. How has that sort of helped you then create your own brand and create your own projects which we should talk about Um, I guess we'll start with take to take but 
first, how do you think Sendshot and getting that experience with a big company has helped you in terms of developing who you are as a broadcaster, as a professional, and it developed your opinions and who you are? Yeah, well, I, I had the privilege of uh, speaking with Ian Mendez at one point earlier in the pandemic, who now writes for The Athletic, just joined them last week. He actually hosted a Zoom call for um, people that wanted to learn about sort of the sport media industry for like, you know, people like me that are grown up Senators fans and want to learn. And I asked him a question directly talking about um, what experiences like people in the industry look for. And he said, you know, versatility is a key thing. And I really have taken that to heart. And I've always sort of had that line of thought and it really sort of confirmed what I already believe that you got to be a pretty versatile person. So I would say the skills that I've learned at Sunshot and the sort of engagement that I've gotten as being a writer um, has helped develop me and what I can do and what I can be in the sport media industry if I want to chase it. And I think that's really helped. And when it comes to take to take, you know, I'm expanding into more of a radio broadcasting format. So again, I'm just adding more layers and more skills of things that I believe I can do. Um, that I think will help me stick out at the end of the day. And, you know, again, it's all stuff that looks great on a resume. Um, so, you know, Sunshot has really helped bolster that and some of the connections I've been able to make have really helped my credibility, although my platform is still very small. I don't have that many followers yet. Um, you know, hopefully we get there one day, but it's it's helped. Yeah. So you've done... you're now revamping yeah. Take to Take. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry go ahead you've done some yeah i just wanted to say you've done some play-by-play -play, you've done some graphics you've done some hosting writing and you mentioned versatility and versatility is a big thing that's what they talk about every day really in our program the professors stress it a lot um so what do you hope to add to your repertoire heading into second semester third year and then fourth year to really come full circle i guess and really establish yourself as like a quadruple threat I guess, doing, doing it all in the sport media industry? I would say in second and third year, I made some steps um, in our TV lab classes. Um, you know, I didn't do any on-air work in second or third year in the TV labs. And, you know, um, I always thought that was what I, the only thing I'd really be interested in. But I, I felt like at this point in second year and third year, I was really doing enough outside of the classroom that I really didn't need more reps on air and I wanted to focus on doing other stuff. So I've taken more of an approach to learning to be a director and an assistant director in class. And I've been doing um, a lot of reps for those whenever I can. So I want to sort of establish myself as somebody who can do that in classrooms and people can look to me if they want a quality director or assistant director. And I think uh, specifically in my couple of shows in third year, uh, I directed one assistant directed the other. And I felt they both went really well. And I sort of helped, if anything, make a name for myself amongst our peers and you know, sort of establish myself that way. And that's what I aim to do rather than just going for more and more reps on air, something I know I'm already um, getting enough experience in doing. And, you know, it's just about adding another layer for me. And even though, you know, I'm looking at writing my law school admission test um, later this year and none of that may matter, at the end of the day, it's something I just want all the extra credibility for in this program in case I want to use it. And I think that's important. I, I've, you were in my TV lab class, correct? I think you were. For this for year? second year. Second year, I think so, yeah. And this year I'm, as well, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I swore you were on TV. With Karen this year. Were we back to back years? Yeah, I was with Karen this year, yeah. I had no idea we were back to back years. Uh, I swear you were on air for second year. Wow, I didn't realize you didn't. Do yeah, I anymore. probably not not my own productions. I think I got casted. Like uh, a couple of people invited me to do their thing, but when I was writing my own stuff, I was always making sure that I was in the director's or assistant director's chair. Um, you know, when I have control over my own content like that, I like to do that. Put myself in those positions. Okay, that makes more sense and why that immediately <laughs> sticks out to why i thought you were on air huh i didn't realize you i guess that 
Taking back on it, you did AD a lot, because I remember helping you with that, because that's the only lead position I'm able to do apart from audio. What did you do um, this year in, and in I guess you're back. Karen's class? What uh, no, it, it's you? a challenge. Director and assistant director, and for any of the other optional roles, I think I did um, a one-minute recording hit for somebody um, as an analyst, so I did do that for one other person, and I was a DDR for somebody else in the minor roles. But in terms of the lead roles, I made sure that I was in director and assistant director because I Your wanted that challenge. Your would help with that, wouldn't it? Uh, you know what? Funny enough, like math was my weakest point of business. I was, uh, I, I got the bare minimum that I needed in terms of math for So you wanted things. to be an accountant, but you weren't good at math. I was horrible at like ah, calculus, but data. Okay. That so you're good with numbers. You're not good with letters. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I'm, I, no I can algebra. do the numbers, and I can do some. Yeah, just don't don't throw letters in there. Don't make it confusing. So how okay. did you like oh, the uh, a, the business class? How how are you liking the business classes? I guess in first year, and then this year as well. How did you like it more than other people? You'd say. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, uh, first year and second year, I would say I did minimal. It, first year, I definitely had known pretty much everything going in because it was actually pretty similar to a couple of marketing and accounting courses I had taken in high school. Um, again, second year was pretty much just an extension of that content, and I felt pretty comfortable with it um, at all times and did really well in both those classes. And I've even, in my electives, I've taken... Um, a couple of business classes again, just to sort of continue to expand my knowledge in it. And I did a creative business of media, which is actually an RTA course in second year um, as an elective. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made because uh, I did pretty well on that. And on that, I do law courses and stuff like that. I, I, I pick pretty hard electives, which surprises a lot of people all the time just because um, and it may sound insane, but I do like the challenge. I feel like it pushes me that little bit more to do well. All right. Well, let's touch on some of the stuff that you've done not affiliated with Ryerson because I think that'll be very interesting, uh, especially some of these stories and experiences you've had with certain things. Uh, and I guess we'll start with one of the major experiences that you've gotten with Take to Take. Um, you did a show with Patrick Talon and Luke Burroughs. Uh, it's sort of a live radio show feel. Uh, you were affiliated with the Barnburner Network, but you have since left there. I want to get some of your thoughts on what working with a company like that was like uh, and sort of some of the big takeaways you had from your experience with both Sendshot, uh, creating professional contracts with uh, these kind of companies and sort of everything you found have everything you found you've learned from these experiences sure um i'll start off with take to take and um you know we obviously got our steps like a lot of people at ryerson do with spirit live and you know i really can't recommend doing spirit live enough to people and i think they again that was something i didn't know existed coming into the program which um has been another pleasant surprise and um, you know, we were able to carry sort of what we were doing into the online format via Zoom, which helped, and that eventually led uh, to us getting noticed, and we went uh, and joined Barn Burner back in September. So uh, we did that for three and a half months or so, and, you know, it was it was a good experience because, it again, it just put another – it gave us all more experience in timing shows. You know, we were doing three hours of scheduled content at the same time every week, and um, preparing for that and making sure you have enough to talk about and coming up with new ideas um, was something that was really good for us to learn. Um, for instance, one thing, so as soon as we hit sort of the dog days of the off season, it became a lot more challenging to get that three hours of content a week because there's only so much news that you can talk about all the time. So we sort of, I, I came up with the idea to start doing tier lists. So we'd spend an hour a week putting things on a tier list and you know, that sort of helps. It's it, it helped us be better when it came to preparation. Um, you know, it also taught us, we eventually left um, later in November, and it also taught us, you know, um, 
opened our eyes to a lot of things that go on in the sport media industry that I'm sure a lot of people are also well aware of, you know, you're forming business relationships, you're forming contractual relationships with people, you're going to be asked to sign things, you're going to be asked to do things to extend yourself. And um, I've always been pretty fortunate that I've had people to fall back on to help me through help me guide me help guide me through those situations, um, where as a lot of other people won't. So Ultimately, at the end of the day, we just didn't feel it was any more or any longer a fit with Barn Burner, and we felt that was a good uh, decision to move on. We've now transitioned back to recording our own content, which we're also very happy with. So, um, I would say, but I, I would recommend getting involved with a network at some point for anybody studying sport media because I think you need to learn how to build those sort of relationships and open your eyes to sort of um, the behind the scenes things that have to go on when you're in a relationship like that. What was your... There are a ton of networks you can do that with. Um, I don't know, Aiden, do you have anything you sort of want to add to... I just wanted to ask what... uh, Yeah, I just wanted to ask what do you think your biggest improvement was just from starting out on Spirit Live with with Take to Take and then ultimately going to Barn Burner? What do you think has been the the biggest improvement um, with your show from when you started way back till now? Oh, I would say the preparation, 100%. I sort of alluded to that earlier, you know. Um, when we were on Spirit Live in first and second year, we would sort of show up um, five, ten minutes before the show started, be like, okay, uh, let's scroll through Twitter, see what happened today, and let's talk about it. Like, that's what it was. But then when we sort of started doing our own content and then eventually doing content for Barn Burner, when you're on a um, timeline and you've got to come up with enough good content to talk about enough engaging content because you're actually doing it for an audience a bigger audience at that point we were doing pretty well with our viewership of barn burner um we wanted to be more engaging so we started um like you guys sent me a big document to go through before the show and um stuff that we were going to talk about that stuff we've been doing now each week with take to take we come up with a big list of stuff we want to go through we bounce ideas off each other and i think that is essential to our growth because it's just all helped us become more familiar with each other what to expect when we're on air with one another and you know it at the end of the day leads to us producing better content talk about another show that you did i don't know how much you actually did of it because the only stuff I could find on it was one episode on Spirit Live's website. Uh, but three guys talk about soccer. Uh, you host the show with Simon Kiszczuk and Nigel Gebekchian, uh, both first-year sport media students who we need to have on. Um, but how did you find that experience talking soccer on, I think it was a podcast format because the file was over an hour. It was. Yeah, the file was over an hour. Um, a how many episodes did you did? Did you do? <laughs> how many episodes did you do? Proper English. Uh, and what were some of your big takeaways of talking soccer in a country that doesn't necessarily follow soccer as closely as other places? Well, uh, I'll, I'll answer your first question. We recorded one episode. That is the only recorded episode. And I don't even think we ever discussed recording a second one, funny enough. I just, um, that was sort of a second, I think that was second semester, um, second year. But whatever reason it was, I just, we, we didn't get around to recording another one. It's hard when you're doing a podcast format and, you know, you've got uh, me, I was commuting to school at the time. And you've got Simon and Agil, both living in different areas downtown. It's hard sometimes, again. Um, I got a bit of experience doing that with the Year 5 Collective, and those were two of the guys that I was bouncing ideas off of. So um, just that one episode came to us decently naturally, and um, it's a good experience for me talking about soccer because I feel like I don't get to do it enough, and especially living in Canada, living in Toronto, um, there's not that much, uh, you know, people, there's not that many people that are in love with the English Premier League like, you know, I would say the three of us are. Um it's it's a good learning curve though at the end of the day and it's something you want to learn how to do you're trying not only to appeal to people that want to consume that content you're trying to branch out and attract people um maybe somebody like aiden who does not watch the premier league or does not pay that much attention and you want to get them into watching your show and that's equally as important a skill i would say 
Huh. That is a good point. That's interesting. It, it, it is a interesting dynamic doing soccer content in North America because you do have to keep in mind that not everybody follows it. And obviously you focused a lot more on the Premier League in that episode because you three are Premier League fans. Um, whereas I talk MLS, which is a very niche audience, um, shall we say. Yeah. But would you want to do another soccer show? Like, is that something that you've considered doing another sort of podcast or anything like that? Uh, or, or do you have enough on your plate currently? Uh, I, I think I would definitely like that challenge at some point, you know, maybe I'd have to clear some stuff off the plate. I, um, you know, between send shot and take to take and, you know, the LSAT coming up this year, I'm, I, I've got, I've got my fair share of stuff that I'm going to want, I'm going to be doing, but it's, it's a definitely a challenge I would like at some point. I want to take on a different audience. I want to create different stuff as much as I like writing about the senators. I also like, uh, it, and I'm sure you guys have got different things and that's something I'll definitely want to do. I would say a actual soccer broadcast a la Rams live um, type thing would be something I would definitely be interested in doing. I um, know soccer play by play, a totally different thing uh, than hockey is, but it's equally something I love. I love watching soccer. I love listening to the announcers, the passion. I don't have the British accent. So that <laughs> is unfortunately going to hold me back a bit when it comes to doing the premier league, but that is, uh, play by play in soccer is something I for sure would like to do in fourth year or when possible. I know that was a conversation. We had a bunch of us um, on Twitter, what, like a year ago? Uh, I think it was Kyle Watson who tried to organize it. And I think he reached out to Ryan Sykes and he said that it might be a possibility uh, in the future, but we can't do live broadcasts because we don't have a truck. Um, which is something they should get, but it also costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I don't know if that's necessarily in the cards. Um, well, but even, if even they do that it, in 10 years, I will gladly come back and do a guest appearance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, even doing it like pre-recorded and like not live, like that'd still be pretty good, I guess. Good experience and just going out there by yourself, even if you want to do it without Rams Live and then just maybe send it to them. They can put it on their website or something, put it on Instagram later. <laughs> yeah. I'll put it out there right now. If anybody wants to do that fourth year, I will grind. I will grind out for that because it's something I want to do. I will put in the hours on that, no question. The only issue with that is we are in the middle of a pandemic, so we don't know if we'll have sports by the time we graduate. Um, I guess. Which is yeah, yeah, only a small that. issue. Uh, although, keep an eye out on Seth Nevsky because he might be coming back with something. And I'll talk to you about this afterwards, actually. Um, but I th it's, again, doing soccer is very interesting. But on top of adding a potential soccer show, you've now added the Four Man Advantage, uh, which is a brand new podcast you're doing with Patrick Talon, Luke Burrows, and Matt Mallard. You have stolen Matt Mallard away from the KMN show, so it is now just the KNN show. Um, <laughs> but I think, I don't know how, I don't think that's an issue at all. Um, how did this get started? How did you start the four man advantage? What do you guys sort of plan to do with this podcast? Yeah, so it's right now, it's just sort of, I would still say there's one episode, uh, that just went out today and it's really still in its developmental stage. Um, it was an idea for Matt, uh, just purely for this season only, just because of the, NHL's North Division. We were going to look at, you know, just coming up with content about the North Division. We've got between myself with the Senators, Matt with the Leafs, Patrick with the Habs, and Luke with the Canucks. We've got four to seven teams represented right there. And all the content is sort of going to be around the uh, Canadian teams. Um, you know, it's maybe a bit looser of a format than Take to Take, where we're very structured. And, you know, there, I think we're a couple of swears on this one. So, um, it's it's a bit looser, a bit more fun, um, a bit more animated, I would say. But it, it's very much still in the early stages, and um, at this point, really still a side project and something we're going to look at building uh, throughout the year. So, well, if you're a, stay tuned. If you're a Jets 
flames or oil or supporter and support media, send them a message because they could use you. Yeah. Uh, where can <laughs> we find this? Where can media. we find this podcast? That where, where do the people need to follow? It'll I'll be in the description, but where where can they go? Yeah, so it's on Twitter at for I'm trying to remember the Twitter username. Matt handles all the social media. It's at four man ABV number four and ADV on Twitter. And from there, you can find links to YouTube and Spotify. Yes, be the eighth uh, follower on their Twitter account. Uh, All right, I did it. I, be the ninth now. Yes. <laughs> Even though I don't use Twitter. Right, be the ninth. That is true. Yes, I. you need to use Twitter. And you tweeted for the first time, which a while was ago. very suboptimal. Uh, yeah, it was a while ago. Uh, that was an interesting tweet. Uh, Twitter's but, cool. I like Twitter. Yes, you can follow Nicholas uh, Robinson on Twitter at Nikos Robinson, but it's N I K O S Robinson, um, who doesn't follow me back. Sub-tweet. That's a really cool um, banner image you got right? going. The the Montreal Canucks, Leafs, and Sens in the background. That's cool. Who designed that? That was all Matt. Matt's been the one that's been putting in the uh, the effort on the show. So I apparently actually don't follow Connor on Twitter. So we <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I, I got. I, I have another comment about the logo. I think you're using the same goal horn that we use for the big league on the yeah. logo. <laughs> That's a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. I, That's I, something I, we have to speak to Matt about. <laughs> uh... No, no, no. It's all good. We're, we're, <laughs> it's just the generic one that you find on Google. Like I didn't design it. So, yeah. Probably. <laughs> I was I know, say, if, if you want, if you want, if you want money or compensation, don't. Uh, I'm not affiliated with that show. And, and go after Matt. So that's not you in the header image of the Twitter account. No comment. <laughs> Eugene Monick yesterday. Um, what did I? I don't think I missed. Actually, I did miss something I wanted to bring up because, as part of my research, um, I do quite a bit of digging and. With you, that was incredibly difficult because there's apparently a famous actor named Nicholas Robinson. Uh, so finding stuff on you is <laughs> challenging getting past all his stuff. Um, but part of that research involves going through people's Facebook feeds. Boy. You loved Facebook in 2014, man. Wow. You like oh, it every sure. single I day. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I actually made an effort earlier in the pandemic, and I went and sort of cleaned up some stuff. So you might not have actually gotten the worst. No, of it. I, my computer was getting so hot and getting so slow, I had to stop scrolling in like May of 2014 <laughs> uh, because there were so many posts. Um, but yeah, sure. don't worry, you're not the worst Facebook account I've looked at. Um, everybody's got their. <laughs> interesting posts and stuff. Um, yours was very sports heavy. I'll give you that. Uh, so I guess that's a positive. You've, cl- you've clearly been a Suns fan for a long time. Uh, but with that, have I missed anything that you have done Sir. in the sport media industry that I couldn't find because there's another Nicholas Robinson who is granted more famous than you are because he's a famous actor. Oh, I, th- I think you covered all the bases pretty well. Um, you know, uh, for anybody watching, just stay tuned. I'm still continuing to work hard, and hopefully there's some more good stuff coming. And now, fourth year, maybe going to start looking post-grad to what I'm doing. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we're getting close to fourth year. Mm-hmm. And you haven't been the only one working hard. The Houston Rockets have been working hard over the last few hours as they get closer and closer to trading James Harden because yeah, I wow. think that's going to happen potentially today from Twitter and everything that Wodge is tweeting because there was a Twitter spat uh, yesterday between, or not Twitter, uh, interview spat, I guess, between John Wall and James Harden and the Rockets and that relationship just isn't salvageable anymore. So uh, it sounds like it's going to be Brooklyn or Philadelphia. Uh, I don't know what each package will look like. Apparently, Brooklyn are offering every first-round pick they have until the end of existence, <laughs> uh, which I think is 10 years. Uh, they can only trade 10 years from now. Wait, are you picks, serious? Uh, in either actual pick- yes, in either actual draft picks or pick swaps, because you can't trade first-round picks in back-to-back years. 
Um, so, yeah, um, that's happening. So we'll, follow, we'll continue to follow that situation uh, as things continue to break. So if you see me looking at my phone, Nick or Aiden, it's because I'm looking to see if James Harden's been traded yet. Yeah, if, if, Philly, <laughs> if Philly gets them, like, but, geez, they're stacked. They, they might just win the ship this year. Same with Brooklyn. Like, that's a triple threat with Durant, Kyrie, and, and Harden now. But And I guess, you know, Harden... Harden hasn't been good to start the year, but when he gets on a, a good team, a team that he actually wants to play for, he's going to light it up, and he's going to be one of the best players in the league. I need I have him on my fantasy team, so I need him to keep playing well. You have you do basketball fantasy? I just started doing it this year, Connor. I got to get into it. I got to learn some more about the NBA. Did you snag James Harden? Uh, third overall third overall yeah interesting i'm surprised he fell but uh, yeah I I, I, I I yeah yeah i'm not surprised he fell because if he does end up on brooklyn there is only one ball that is true uh, and there are three guys who want it at all times so that could be an issue um and obviously his extracurriculars could potentially be an issue in the future um but until he gets dealt we don't know what's going to happen. The entire NBA has COVID at this point. They've canceled or they postponed the Atlanta game, um, Atlanta Phoenix game tonight. So that's just another game added to the list. Celtics have had like three games postponed so far. Um, so the NBA is not in a good place right now uh, as they continue to work towards trying to solve the COVID issue. And they added more protocols and restrictions uh, in order to try to stop the spread. But they're still doing better than the Raptors, which is saying a lot because the Raptors suck after they lost again last night uh, in a heartbreaker in the very end of the game when I believe Pascal missed buzzer beater. Um, was that last, last night or two but, nights ago? Do either be good? It was two nights ago, right? I think it was last night. Oh, man, yeah. In the yeah, last two nights. They did go back to back. Pretty oh, sure yeah, you're right. Like literally two games straight. Yeah, two games in a row they lost by one point. Yeah, hasn't been good. Nick Nurse is calling out the team, too. Nick, I'm curious. And yeah, it's true. Yeah. Well, he kind of has to at this point. But other Nick, um, I'm interested to hear your opinion on what you think the Raptors should do this season. Obviously, you're not a huge basketball fan. You're primarily hockey and soccer um, with a little bit of basketball sprinkled on top and a little bit of Jays uh, as well. Uh, so we'll talk a bit of soccer because some Toronto FC stuff happened and I have some opinions. Uh, but... What do you think the Raps should do this season? Do you think they should still try to go for it, or do you think they should try to do a quick rebuild and prepare for next offseason to accumulate as much money and picks as possible in what is supposed to be a very good draft class? Well, I am very much still on the learning curve for basketball. I did buy NBA 2K21 this year, so I did take my next steps in learning <laughs> um, and the league. But... Um, you know, if there was ever a time period or a season in which I think any league, any team should have no problem with taking a year off and forgetting about it, I would say that the COVID-19 2021 season uh, is an okay time. If you, were a, if you were the Toronto Raptors to take a year off, catch your breath, regroup, you know, this team's been through a lot over the past few years and... Um, I don't think anybody was expecting them to come out, storm the gates, and win the championship again this year or be a huge contender again. It was always going to be tough for them. Um, but if they're going to take a year off, why not this year? Because, you know, it's the COVID-19 year. It's not like they're going to be in Toronto to win anything anyways. That's a good point, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, like, and I got interrupted last week because my computer crashed when I was talking about this, but... This Raptors team <laughs> reminds me a lot of, and I guess Nick can also relate to this because he's a Jays fan, the 2017 Blue Jays. They're just coming off two back-to-back -back appearances in the playoffs, ALCS in, in both years. And, you know, you're, you're thinking, like, do we want to compete again this year? Or do we shut it down? Like, Bautista's having a bad year. Encarnacion's not doing well. It's kind of the same right now with the Raptors. Kyle Lowry's not playing well to start the year. Siakam looks okay, but Norman Powell's not doing well. Um, and the team, obviously, is, has two wins so far this year. They're second worst in the league. 
So they're in a tricky spot. Like, do you want to still compete for that championship or do you tear it down? And what the Jays did was they kind of let it play out until guys like Donaldson left and guys like Encarnacion left and he didn't get anything back um, for those guys. And I don't want the Raptors to make that mistake. So I think that you got to look at this team right now and, you know, they might still make the playoffs this year. It could still happen, but they're definitely not going to win a championship. There's way too much competition. There's way too many teams that are better than them. So I would really like to just see them try and tear it down and get as many assets in return because I don't want them making the same mistake that the Blue Jays made. And obviously the Blue Jays now are on the right trajectory, but you can make the argument that if they got ahead of the game like they should have starting in 2017, things would have looked up a lot sooner uh, than they did compared to uh, when they started to finally look better last summer. So if you are the Toronto Raptors, maybe you want to get ahead of the curve and you know, maybe the pain is this year and, you know, maybe one year after, and then you're starting to look up. So just from a business perspective, I think that would make a bit more sense. And, and trying for James Harden isn't getting making better. James Harden is a game time decision tonight as well. Um, so I don't know if that means anything. Uh, basically what's happening is the Rockets are keeping him away from the team from now on. So he didn't practice today. Okay. Uh, and... I don't think he will play or practice again until he is traded in the next few days to one of Brooklyn or Philadelphia from my interpretation of what Adrian Wojnarowski has been tweeting uh, because it's been an interesting situation to follow. Uh, but the Raptors are very interesting situ- in a very interesting situation right now. And they're two and six, I think on this or two and seven, two and eight, something like that on the season. Mm-hmm. Um, They've lost double-digit leads in almost every game. Um, So this might be the year they blow it up. This might be the year... I I say blow it up. This might be the year they trade Kyle Lowry and do a quick reset um, and try to pick somebody really good up in free agency uh, this summer because it's quite a good free agent class. Uh, but again, that's for Masai to figure out who they also have to sign because he is on an expiring contract, which losing him would be tough. But let's move on to the league that you were talking about in the MLB because there were some things that happened uh, involving Toronto Blue Jays. Specifically, Francisco Lindor was not traded to them. Uh, Instead, he ended up with the Mets, who are spending more money than anybody in the history of baseball ever and somehow found all of this money all of a sudden because they got a new owner. Um, Quite a big deal. Uh, Involved a few prospects. uh, Pitcher going back to Cleveland as well. The Jays were reportedly one of the final offers, I guess. I guess, or runners-up in acquiring Windor. Uh, the full package was going to the Mets, Francisco Lindor, and Carlos Carrasco. And then going to the Indians was Ahmed uh, Rosario, Andreas Jimenez, Josh Wolf, and Isaiah Green. Uh, so, Aiden, I don't know how much you can tell us about those guys. Yeah. But what do you think about this trade for the Mets? And what do you think about this trade for Cleveland? Um... Well, you got to look at the two teams. So the Mets, they're kind of in a situation right now where I think they're just trying to win some respect back to their their fan base. Obviously, the Yankees have kind of um, stepped into the forefront of the New York baseball scene, and the Mets have been struggling to make the playoffs the last couple of years. They've been they've been banging on the door a little bit, like they've been they've been in some wild card races, you know. And they they always have that good uh, pitching rotation with Syndergaard and. Uh, they had DeGrom and, and Stroman, but also they've been dealing with a ton of injuries. Stroman didn't play at all last year, I believe. He decided to sit out the year. Um, so I think it's a big trade. Obviously, when you get a guy like Francisco Lindor, it's humongous. It's you know it's going to break the baseball, wo- baseball world for the day. Um, and he plays shortstop as well, which is a big position in baseball. Um, he's got a big bat. He's a gold glover. So it's definitely going to be a big improvement for the Mets, and it's a game changer because now, you know, maybe they do finally make the playoffs. Um, But then also, I think the piece that a lot of people aren't talking about is Carlos Carrasco because he's a a guy who did have, I believe, a below 3 ERA, and he's had a below 3 ERA for the past four or five seasons. He's been, you know, arguably the ace of that Cleveland Indians 
staff since uh, Corey Kluber left. So I think I think it's a great trade for the Mets. You got to look at it as a big win for them. And then in the case for the Indians, um, they um, it's disappointing because they did have a couple good years um, with Lindor and, and Jose Ramirez and, and, like I said, Kluber and a, a great pitching rotation. And that didn't come to to uh, fruition they made it to the world series but they didn't beat the cubs that year and now they're looking at more of a rebuild and they got a lot of pieces back for uh for lindor i wouldn't say it's like there's any standout like number one prospect that they're getting in return which honestly they probably should have gotten for for lindor um i think you know even if you trade him to the jays the jays might have you know, given up more, you would have gotten maybe a Lourdes Gurriel Jr. back. He's not a prospect anymore, but he's still a very solid player. Um, and then you're looking at maybe Groshans as well in there. So um, I really like the trade for the Mets, to be honest. I think the Indians could have gotten more back. Um, the Indians got a lot of players in return, but I don't know about Caliber. Caliber, caliber doesn't really match the quantity in my eyes. Um, but... Yeah, I gotta give the win to the Mets on this trade. Whenever you can get a shortstop, probably the best shortstop. Would you say he's the best shortstop in the league, Nick? I, I think he is. He's up there for sure. Um, and obviously defensively, he's he's one of the best. Certainly, yeah, uh, he's gotta be up there for sure. Yeah, exactly. So whenever you can get a guy like that, you know. Yeah, no, I think. Uh... Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is just so bad. <laughs> blame it, blame it on Discord and OBS. Uh, uh, yeah, blame it on Discord and OBS. So, go. It's all you though. Take uh, it. By you the way, the we have a little bit of breaking news. Um, we have a bit of breaking news from the NBA from Mark Stein. The Rockets are pursuing a p- trade package from the 76ers that would be headlined by Ben Simmons and Tyrese Maxey. Wow. So Simmons so going back the other news. way. Uh, Potentially. We'll see if Philadelphia would actually agree to that. Uh, but, Nick, now you can talk after being cut off four different times because <laughs> of lag and me. <laughs> oh, it's all good. This is this is the struggle of the at-home studios. Like, this is it right here. You're seeing it. But, um, perspective, there was a lot of ties between the two for a long time. Like, this, this was a rumor that was sitting around since the beginning of last season. And um, if you're a Blue Jays fan, you're still sitting at home waiting for the big move because they were, we were essentially promised a big move for the Blue Jays this summer because it seemed like they had cleared a lot of money the past couple of seasons, specifically to make an impact. And now you're seeing a lot of names go off the board and you're still wondering where that move they're going to make is coming from. So, um, you know, as a runner up in the Francisco Lindor deal, you know, it kind of sucks to miss out on a player of that caliber because. Not that often are they available, but hopefully for them that means there's something uh, down the road. But if you're a New York Mets fan, you're thrilled with what you've got back here because you've got one of the best shortstops in the MLB. I think- and speaking of Blue Jays, they just signed Mark Shapiro to a two-year, or not two-year, five-year contract extension. Uh, so he'll continue to be with the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, but Aiden, what were you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this, by the way, guys. Um yeah, I, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I think maybe one of the bright spots for uh, for the Jays is that Bichette is now confirmed as probably the shortstop of the future. You know, if they got Lindor, then he takes his spot. Bichette moves to second. Where does Biggio go? The outfield. So now the Jays have a more clear view of what their team's going to be looking like, and now they can start looking at, you know, their outfield. And George Springer's still out there. The Mets are rumored to be... Uh, looking at him but maybe getting Lindor takes them out of it a little bit um so you know Springer's still out there Trevor Bauer is still out there DJ LeMahieu is still out there um apparently the the Yankees and and him aren't really getting along right now so if he comes here I think that's big Bichette's been saying it he's he thinks he's the best hitter in baseball to get him on the team would be huge so there's still a lot of names uh out there and I will say, I think the Jays will get one of those three. LeMahieu, Springer, or Bauer. I think he's coming to Toronto. Like Nick said, Shapiro promised a big offseason. It's, it's got to happen at some point. They're going to sign one guy. Just a little bit of lip service at this point. They need it for the fans. Exactly. Nick, 
Who would you like the Toronto Blue Jays to pursue in free agency? If you could name three players, two or three players. Uh, and if you don't want to name specific players, what do you think their biggest positions of need are? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I've, I've had this debate quite a few times with, uh, with some friends about Trevor Bauer. And, um, you know, he comes across to a lot of people as a problematic figure, but I just still see a very good starter in him. And I think, you know, adding some more quality starters to this team is always going to be a must. Um, the outfield is a problem, and we saw that last year. It, we, we need some better defense in the outfield. We need some better hitters in the outfield. Um, I'm all for it, pretty much an overhaul of that position at this point because, you know, we need to find something that works here if we want to be able to compete in the division next year. So I would say uh, the outfield is the priority, and I think Springer will fix that. Yeah. Aiden, any kind of that, or do you disagree with him? <laughs> Anything to get Randall Gritchick out of town, I'm all for. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully newly extended Mark Shapiro can make that happen. Um, do we want to talk football or do we just want to move on to soccer? Aiden, it's up to you. Um, I'll just say my predictions quickly. I got the Chiefs over the Browns. I got the Bills over the Ravens. I got the Bucks over the Saints, and that'll be a heartbreaker for Saints fans and Drew Brees. Um, and then I got the Packers over the Rams. All right. Football fan Nick, do you have any counter to that, or do you agree with everything Aiden just said? <laughs> uh, we'll say the football fan inside me who I've never met is going to say go Bills. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Good. Have you ever seen a Bills game? No. Never watched it. Yeah. I, I watched one game last year, and that uh, Allen guy seems real cool. <laughs> okay. I was just – because they used to play games in Toronto. Um, and I've been to one game at the Rogers Center football game. and Those are always that cool. I remember those. It's like, like one a year, right? Insane. Yeah, it was like one a year. Uh, I went with my grandpa – and that was not there were so many fights <laughs> as we were leaving the stadium a cop was just dragging a guy in handcuffs away like it was nuts yeah. um and i was like 10 when this happened so it was crazy um but yeah i was a shout out to my grandparents for a while listening to this if you can even hear us at this point because the audio <laughs> i have no idea what it sounds like um but Let's talk some soccer, which both of them don't care about. Uh, <laughs> specifically, your team, Norwich FC. Um, I'm sorry you're a Norwich fan, uh, because that can't be easy. Although, they're doing incredibly well this season. Uh, so, currently top of the championship. What are the chances you think they will pull off promotion this season? I'll start by saying on your first comment, you know, you don't start cheering for a, uh, you know, a, a yo-yo club because you think it's going to be easy. Um, in fact, if you're me, you don't choose to start cheering for them at all. You sure just naturally do. But um, no, I would say in terms of the championship this year, they've performed extremely well. Uh, I like the squad. I think this is a much better squad um, than what they had in the Premier League last year. Um, I think the long-term outlook on the squad in general is a lot better. And uh, I've been feeling pretty confident since day one that promotion has been on the cards. And it certainly looks that way at the, at the halfway point. And I think the big thing that sticks out for me, if you look at the championship table and the other teams in the top 10, the, how well Norwich has performed against those other teams. They've been able to beat everybody in the top 10 except for uh, Watford and Bournemouth, who they were coincidentally relegated with last year. Huh. Okay. And what do you think it will happen with Emil Buendia? Uh, if I... I think it's Buendia. That's how you pronounce that. Uh, Emiliano Buendia, um, you know, obviously lots of links to Arsenal there for him. Um, you know, Nigel Gubekchen, who's in our program, big Arsenal supporter, has been uh, on my case about that one a lot. But uh, I don't think he's going anywhere. I think Norwich have him tied down to a good contract. I think he's in a good situation here. I think if he was going to move, it would have been last summer. And I think everybody missed their chance there, and I couldn't believe nobody picked him up because I think he really is a true quality Premier League footballer. And in, he's showing it in the championship this year. He's absolutely bossing the league. He just won December's Player of the Month today that was announced. 
And uh, I think Norwich will price them out of any move because they have the control over him. And I think he likes the situation here. So I can't see him moving at all. And I'm very happy that he won't. And who do you think hopefully. will join you in promotion then this season? Oh, man. You know, I, I tell people all the time, um, you know, people that are Premier League fans or people that just, like, don't watch the championship much, that it really is the one of the most exciting leagues in the world because it's so, so unpredictable. There's always teams yeah, coming in and out of the mix, and there's always teams that make late pushes to join the mix. Um, in terms of the automatic promotion, I think uh, I really like Swansea's squad. They're in second right now, and I think they'll be in that mix at the, towards the end. I think they've got a good young group there. The playoffs are such a uh, mystery bag in terms of what happens always because you've got four teams in there and they're so unpredictable. But um, Brentford lost in the play final to, Lug- or to Fulham last year. But I think uh, they're going to break their, I think it's like an 80-year curse now of like not winning games at one play. And I think, I think they'll break that and they'll get promoted. Huh. Okay. Interesting. It's good. I, I've never been a huge fan of the championship, but I've heard that it is one of the most exciting leagues on the planet. I still think MLS is better because of how even it is. But that is also a very, 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 very biased opinion. Uh, and you would know because you are a Toronto FC fan, or at least have attended a game. Uh, yes. So I don't know how closely you follow the team, but how closely do you follow Toronto FC? Uh, I would say last year I followed last just because of uh you know the covid season it was just too weird for me almost at times but i would say definitely uh in between the for the defoe years and the javinko years i was a pretty firm mainstay on the toronto fc uh fan bandwagon okay so how familiar are you how familiar are you with toronto fc's brand new manager hiring chris armas uh, again, I would say probably my experiences with MLS more how my experiences with the MLB are. Uh, I follow Toronto FC quite a bit, but you know, outside of that, I don't pay too much attention except for guys like superstars like Zlatan or Rooney who come through the league. Um, but I, it's an interesting hire to say the least. It may be a bit underwhelming. Um, after links to guys like Patrick Vieira, it seems like a bit of a underwhelming hire, but I'm hopeful at least because, you know, I didn't think Greg Vanny was very good at first and look how he was able to turn them around. Yeah. I, it's, it is an interesting hire. Um, obviously I fall on the last a lot closer than most people, um, most sane people. Uh, but the big thing with Armas, I think the big issue is he's just another failed MLS manager. Like he managed for Red Bull. Uh, to he'd been with since I want to say 2016 or 2017. No, he took over for Jesse Marsh in 2018 um, when he went to RB Salzburg. Um, who Jesse Marsh is a very very good manager, um, by the way. But Armas, I was talking to one of my co-hosts. Uh, Josh Boland on the MLS Multiplex podcast and he's very tuned into like he likes tactics and he likes stuff like that and I sort of asked him like what is what positive is there in terms of Toronto bringing him in Uh, and this is exactly what he said Uh, first of all uh, dot 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 which is never a good sign Uh, he followed that up with here's the thing about Armas he took what Red Bull New York was best at and said, let's go ahead and work on a plan B. So while you're smiling at that and you think it's kind of funny and probably terrible, I don't have an issue with it because Toronto never had a plan A. If we're being completely honest in a tactical perspective. That's fair. Uh, Greg Vanny, I'm fair. very open about this. I hated his tactical decisions. I hated his pro- player personnel decisions. I thought he was a good manager. But when it came to player personnel decisions and specific substitutions and constantly seeing Laurent Simon and Eric Zavaleta enter the pitch, um, I had issues. I think Armas would be good, 
with Toronto because he'll actually have money to spend. And then I believe it was Sam. Oh God, I hate saying his name. Sam Skarskal. God, I'm so bad at this. Uh, the Athletic reporter, uh, one of the Athletic MLS reporters, tweeted this, and uh, I hate it. Um, of a, I quote. Of course, as Josh Cloak and I have mentioned, there was a sense around MLS that Ali Curtis and Bill Manning wouldn't want a coach who would demand a lot of roster control. Not getting more control was part of why Vanny left, from what I'm told. Armas probably isn't that guy. Sounds like Toronto FC, specifically Ali Curtis and Bill Manning, are taking a lot more control in terms of player personnel decisions. And... I don't think that would be a bad thing, but I also don't think it's a good thing. Uh, it's, again, a very interesting situation. I don't know what will happen. It'll be very dependent on who they bring in because right now they have two center backs and two right backs, and that is it in terms of defenders, unless you're going to include Julian Dunn in that conversation, but he's still a kid. Um, they have a super draft coming up. Having a manager in place for that is huge. The big search, though, is going to be for the DP. And I want to get your thoughts on it because you follow Europe. And I had Rachel Drury on the MLS Multiplex podcast in the middle of December. And we talked a bit about what their next DP could be. And she mentioned that she thinks it will be a younger European who hasn't been giving a, given a real shot in Europe yet at a big club. Is there anyone that springs to mind for you when... I say that player, and is there anyone you'd like Toronto to potentially look at to bring in in that sort of sphere of possible transfer options? It's so hard to pick exact candidates when you're looking at this sort of topic just because, you know, there are so many different players out there, and we've seen so many guys come to MLS from different places places in the world, whether it be younger guys in Europe, and that's been certainly a bigger trend. There's been younger players coming to the MLS that, you know, it mix that in with the veterans that are coming in are not exactly in their late 30s anymore. They're maybe now in their later 20s, which is overall boosted the quality of the league. And, you know, I look at somebody like uh, Carlos Bella and what a difference he's made in the MLS, and that's sort of the player you want to look at in my opinion, at least, if you're Toronto FC, not Carlos Villa specifically, but a player of him, a player that has proven himself in Europe, but is maybe just being phased out pretty rapidly, um, but can come to MLS on a big salary and can perform well, and you want that type of player. Um, you know, Toronto FC has had a lot of success with their DPs in the past, and a, a lot more success, I think, than most teams in the MLS have had. They've, they've done very well in that regard, and I think since the Defoe debacle, it's something they deserve a lot of credit for, for how they've handled their DPs. Um, but besides Javinko and the impact he was able to make in his first couple of years, um, Pozuelo now, they haven't exactly secured a massive offensive force, a guy that can single-handedly go and score and assist and win you games. Uh, Javinka was able to do that in his couple, first couple of years. Pozuelo's been taking over a fair share of that load now, although a I think lot of can do that. from the panel. I have to cut you off. I think Pozuelo yeah. can do that. Like, he won an MVP this past season. Right? But I, I would consider... No, I, I, no disrespect to Pozuelo. I would consider him more of a... Um, I'm trying to find the right word for this. I don't think he can take over games on his own. I think he's the excellent backbone piece of the team, as in he can help control all aspects. But I think ideally you want somebody more there, a better uh, technical player that can take over games, sort of how Carlos Bella has been able to. And I think that's what you've got to look at, um, at least in my opinion, when you're looking for a new DP. They need a winger with pace, is I think what they need. That, and that's that's sort of what I'm alluding to, like specifically a winger with pace, and that that helps. You know, while Pozuelo is great at what he does, and he is able to rack up goal contributions at the end of the day, he's a central midfielder, and um, he plays that role well. 
but you want sort of that dynamic force. Like last top, last question on TFC. Over. What do you think of Josie Altador now? Hard to say because, you know, he's done so much for Toronto FC since he came over, but I'm okay with giving Io Akinola a lot more game time. I think he proved that he belongs last year, and he certainly made his claim to be a big part of this team going forward. Um, it's hard to see, and Altador, there's so many injury concerns with him. That's one thing you cannot take for granted. He is... Uh, he spent half his time in Toronto FC, at least in the past couple of years, uh, the majority of his time on the treatment table. and um, So it's really hard to get a read of what exactly Josie Altador is now, because when he is healthy, he still has proven to be an effective player, but it's hard to get a read if he can't stay healthy. All right. Interesting takes. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what Toronto FC does uh, over the next... <sighs> Off season, I guess, because we don't really know when it's going to end. Because MLS might be using its force majeure clause to cancel the CBA. Uh, but I talked about that on the MLS Multiplex podcast, so you can go and check that out because that was up uh, Monday night. And you should also go check out the Staff and Graph podcast because they have some announcements there, uh, which you should all go and check out. Uh, but let's talk hockey because that's something we can all talk about, as opposed to having Aiden sit there silently for twenty minutes as we talk about soccer. Um, well, I'll, let's do the quick signing stuff. Uh, I'll do the yes, good, bad uh, thing we do, which we need to come up with a better name for it, <laughs> better stra- or I need to come up with a better name and a better strategy for it. Uh, but basically, there were only like five, six contracts signed that were of note. So yeah, basically say good, bad, um, and that's it. So we'll start off with the one that everyone was sort of expecting to happen in the New York Islanders signing Matt Barzell to a three-year, $21 million contract. Nick, good or bad? Good. 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 How about you, Aiden? All right. Jesper Bratt signed a two-year, $2.75 million AAV deal with the New Jersey Devils. He probably won't be able to play until, like, February, February or March due to quarantine and still needing to get a visa. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you which one to go. Uh, <laughs> Nick, what are your thoughts on Jeff Pratt? Um, I would say bad just because of the situation. They're both now in. This should have gotten done so much, so long ago. Aiden, what are your thoughts before I break some news? I think it's a pretty good contract. Uh, I like Brad as a player. Two years. Not too risky. I like it. I do. All right. Well, breaking news from the Vegas Golden Knights. They've named the first captain in franchise history. Oh, wow. In Mark Stone. Wow. He's been named the captain of the Vegas Golden Knights. So congratulations to Mark Stone and the Las Vegas Golden Knights. I think I might need to go for the Oh, yeah. yeah oh, true. I, right. Sorry. I guess it's good we're doing a podcast with a sense of fan as this happens. Hey, you got some good prospects back from that. Yeah, yeah that's true. We, we should also yeah, mention uh, about it. Dylan Larkin, named uh, captain of the Detroit Red Wings as well today. Yes, that is true. Although nobody cares about the Red Wings because they suck right now. Um, no offense to the Detroit Red Wings. Um, oh, more basketball stuff. Sorry, from Chris Haynes. Houston Rockets are also requesting Philadelphia 76ers defensive specialist Matisse Thibel in a trade package for James Harden. League sources tell Yahoo Sports. Uh, which, again, I'm just going to plug them. If you haven't checked out Matisse Thibel's YouTube channel, do it. It is unbelievable. Even though he hasn't put up anything, his stuff in the bubble was so good. He's an amazing editor. Go and watch those videos because they're really, really good. Next up on our good bad, uh, Andy Green signed a one-year $700,000 deal with, I forgot to put the team name in there, but it is the New York Islanders. Good. Let's switch it up. It's Ooh, bad. Conflicting opinions. Did I already say it? Oh, sorry, it was delayed. What did Nick say? Said bad? 
I said it's bad. Okay. Uh, I don't like the player. I don't like the stage in his career. I it's a good will sign. And this is Lou Lamarello doing something for a guy that's given him some service over the years. That's about it for me. Honestly, that that's what I don't mind about it. You know, it's a veteran player that's going to teach the young guys a lot of stuff and to get him for one year, seven hundred k. Why not? That's that's how I look at it. Yeah, I, I think it's fine as long as he's not actually playing. Yeah, he's not going to be playing big minutes or anything. Bottom pair, maybe that seventh defenseman. I think that's that's about right for him. Yeah, potentially. Good veteran presence, I think, is probably the main piece of that. Uh, next up, the most shocking signing that nobody saw coming. Mike Hoffman signing a one-year, $4 million deal with the St. Louis Blues. Uh, Nick, good or bad? Good. I like the player. I've watched him a lot, especially uh, early on in his career. I think he's going to score 100 power play goals for them. Uh, no, uh, he'll score less than that, but he's going to really help their special teams. And uh, in a shortened season, that's going to really bolster the Blues' chance of duking it out with Vegas and Colorado for top spot in that division. All right. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a great deal. I, I think, you know, earlier on in the year, we were thinking about Hoffman being a free agent, and he might be getting six, seven mil in free agency, and four million dollars for Hoffman. That's that's a steal, I think. You know, like Nick said, he's a power play specialist. He can bang home a lot of goals on that right side, and he's good good at five on five as well. You know, the the Blues without Tarasenko this year looks like again, or for at least the start of the year, they're going to be lacking some some offensive depth, and to get Hoffman, that's that's huge for them, and. I think that's a, a huge price as well. You know, $4 million for a guy who can score 30 goals, that's that's really good. All right. Next up, Marcus Felino signing a three-year, $3.1 million per year deal with the Minnesota Wild. Nick, good or bad? Good. I really like the player. Um, he is underratedly one of the best uh, pure defensive specialists in the NHL, and um, if deployed correctly, in that, but probably on the third line for Minnesota, and if they get some more help down there, he can be a very, very effective shutdown player. So it's hard to come by. So I like him and think it's a good deal for the Wild. Aiden? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with what Nick said. And also, he's not the oldest guy as well. He's pretty young still. So... I like the deal. I really like it. All right. Next up, we have our final signing, Travis Hamanick, signing a one-year, $1.25 million deal, the Vancouver Canucks. Aiden, good or bad? I think that's insane that they only got him for 1.25. I think that's a really good deal for the Canucks. I know he didn't have the best year last year, but it's still Travis Hamanick, and he's a former... You know, top four guy. He's probably going to play in the Canucks. I would say top four this year, and yeah, less than two mil, less than less than one point three. That's ridiculous. I think it's very good for them, and only one year too. So if it doesn't work out, you can always get rid of him. Nick, it's bad. It's okay in the sense that it's one year, pretty low risk. But I think it's a bit of a panic move from Jim Benning because I think Vancouver's had a pretty disastrous off season, all things considered. And I got really under the nerves of my co-host of Take to Take Luke Burrows when I was telling him this yesterday. <laughs> but uh, I think I think the deal is pretty disastrous. I think it's you know largely an attempt to cover up what's been a pretty subpar off season from the Canucks. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't really like the signing. I don't think it's a great fit, and I think they should have done a lot more. I side with Aiden on this one. I think this is a great signing. I think he's a good Chris Tanev replacement for $1.25 million, but that is just me. Uh, other hockey news, Corey, I've... Okay, I see you wanted to say something. Rip into me. <laughs> me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. I didn't want to rip oh, in, no, okay. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. Um, oh, that's okay. Corey, Corey Crawford retired. Um, finally stepped away after signing his a brand new contract with the New Jersey Devils. Um, stepped away without playing a game for them. He will not count against their salary cap due to the structure of the contract, uh, due to the new CBA and the adjustment around that, because he's 
because of the way he's paid, he's he can be have his contract number cap it just removed uh, when he retires. So that is no longer an issue. However, a big issue is they only have Mackenzie Blackwood in goal, and they claimed Eric Comrie off waivers yesterday. Uh, so it's looking like it'll be a Mackenzie Blackwood Scott Wedgwood um, pairing. So. Good luck, New Jersey, because you're going to need it. Um, although I did pick Mackenzie Blackwood in our fantasy hockey draft, so there's that. Did you really? When um, did you get him? Last yeah, round? Late. I got him very late. No, not last round. It was, like, very, very late. It so was is, one he of your, is he your third or fourth goalie? Uh, he is my third goalie. My three goalies, I got Vasilevsky at 10. Nice. He fell. Um... I got Anton Hudobin from Dallas, uh, and I got um, obviously Blackwood as another goalie. Right, right, right. So throwing away the wins, but going for saves. I don't. I don't know if you <laughs> guys Blackwood's saw. Blackwood's gonna get shelled. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw my uh, Instagram story a couple of days ago, but I drafted Nikita Kucherov in the first round of my fantasy draft. <laughs> Because it's a keeper league and he was unprotected. Yeah. Oh man, um, some one of my my buddies did that, and it, but it's not a keeper league. It what? is just an open draft, and he drafted him fairly early on, and we were all in a Zoom call, and everybody started laughing. Like when he picked, he's like, "What?" He's like, "How how how is he available at a <laughs> hundred? Like, man, he's missing the whole year. That's why he was available." And he's like, "Oh, really?" Yeah, oh, damn. You missed The only way he play, I see him playing is if Steven Stamkos gets hurt and they're able to put Stamkos on LTIR as opposed to um, Kucherov. Yeah, sure. But, hey, that's not a good pick. Uh, especially not in a keeper league. And also, Aiden, I don't think that's a good pick. But Why? 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 Let's sense. get into it. Let's talk about it a little bit. Why don't you think that's a good pick? Why? Because I think you could have gotten him later. I didn't want to risk it, so I won my league last year, so I had the last pick, and it's a 10-person league, so I had picks 10 and 11, and then I don't pick again until, like, 20 picks later. He, it's Nikita Kudrov. He's one of the best players in fantasy. He's not protective. Someone's going to take him early. They want him on their team for years to come. If, if I wanted him, I, I would have to take him with one of those two picks in the first or second round, back-to-back, back, 10 or 11. I took him with 10. Who did you take at 11? Huberto. Okay. My keep my keepers are Vasilevsky, uh, Carlson, John Carlson, and uh, Pasternak, and then I got Cooch, and then I got Huberto, and then I think I picked like uh, J T Miller. Um, who are some right, other guys? We don't Torker. need to. Yeah, you don't. Uh, yeah, that's true. Viewers don't care about our fantasy. Team. Carter Hart uh, as well. Talk about that Carter Hart as well. Oh wow. Yeah. That's a nice pick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Other hockey news. Evander Kane files for bankruptcy. Uh, oh, Evander Kane too, I got. <laughs> that may not be a good pick anymore because uh, he is in quite a lot of financial trouble right now. Um, he has lost $1.5 million in gambling over the last 12 months. Uh, he is currently dealing with $26.8 million in total liabilities. Uh, he has $10.2 million in assets. These are all in court documents uh, that were filed when he filed for bankruptcy. Uh, those $10.2 million in assets are mostly in housing. Uh, he is considering opting out of this season due to the recent birth of his first child, who is like six months old or something around that. Uh, and even though the opt-out date was December 24th, he... Lawyer claim that he can still opt out, although we don't know how. Uh, but I would assume that leads to the cancellation of his contract if they're doing it now. Yeah, which yeah. I think is one of the possibilities. Uh, and Centennial Bank is currently, or has filed a lawsuit last week, seeking eight point three million dollars uh, from him due to outstanding loans uh, that he has not paid back or outstanding debts he's not paid back. Um, it's just, I, I saw a lot of people clowning him 
on Twitter and crapping on him. Uh, I don't like that. Yeah. I don't think that's fair. Like, it's just an unfortunate situation. Yeah. As it's a, a young daughter. It's, it's, as it's easy a, to dunk on him and say, well, that's why he wanted the Jake Paul fight. You know, it's easy. That's an easy layup joke to make. But at the end of the day, you know, these are uh, these are real people. And you know, everybody goes through some sort of financial hardship at some point in their life. And, you know, maybe there's some sort of gambling problem there that, you know, he's going to deal with away. And it sucks that he's a high profile player and is therefore, you know, this sort of information becomes public. That's the downside of being an athlete. But, um, you know, I can't really blame him for wanting to opt out of the season right now. It's just if there's other stuff going on in his personal life, like with his daughter and stuff like that. But, you know, overall for Evander Kane, it's a, it's a, you don't want to see anybody in that situation. Yeah. Bob Boner, the coach of the San Jose Sharks yesterday, did say that Kane is on board for the 2021 season, but that could change. But yeah, he did say, I won't make a comment on any player's personal situation, but I am assured that he will be here for the whole season and that he's on board. So I guess that they've had a conversation and he knows what's up and he expects that Kane will, will play the whole year, but... We don't know what, what Kane himself is thinking. He hasn't publicly made a comment about this yet, I don't believe. Oh, well, he hasn't. Uh, but it, that's basically all we know at this point. Uh, so we'll wait and, to hear more information. Um, but, yeah. Other news. NBC has a panel change. Um, specifically, the, ones of, the one move of note uh, was Mike Milbury is out. Uh, he has been booted from NBC. Uh, it's about time that happened after all of his comments in the bubble and ever. Um, so he's out and they've replaced him on the panel with another Mike, uh, except this time it's Mike Babcock. Uh, two weeks before he gets fired. <laughs> oh God, here we go. Uh, I don't know how he's going to work as a panel member because wasn't the thing with Babcock was it was hard to understand him at times. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's going to work, but I did like how... This is, this is certainly not a less problematic mic that they've uh, replaced Mike Milbury with. Um, True. I saw a joke on Twitter saying uh, Mike Babcock on his first day was going to go around asking all the other panelists who they think is the hardest working from yeah. uh, least to hardest working, and then he was going to publicly announce it on air. Um, you know, again, easy to make that sort of joke, but I, I, I've got to believe that there was somebody more, a better person, maybe somebody that's also pretty qualified that they could have just gone and hired, but I guess they have a pretty niche idea for Babcock going forward that they want to Im implement in the station. Who knows? Uh, it's going to be interesting to see him in that role for sure. But I guess we'll see. I thought Steve Dangle put it well on the SDP last night uh, where he said, this is the beginning of the Mike Babcock rehabilitation tour or the Mike Babcock rehabilitation tour has begun uh, to get back into hockey. I think it was a really interesting way of putting it and probably pretty accurate um, because I know he was doing some coaching with, uh, I believe it was the University of Vermont. He was doing some advisor work yeah. for them. Uh, but He did get yeah. consideration for the Washington vacancy. I, I, I heard that. Yes, he was considered, wasn't he? That is true. It's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with him. There are still some coaches who need to be hired. Um, Bruce Boudreaux immediately springs to mind uh, as he's still out of a job but it's going to be we'll see how Mike Babcock does on TV because I don't know how good that's going to go but other news Bruins are retiring Willie O'Ree's number it is about time uh, obviously first black player in the NHL uh, played blind in one eye as well because of course he did uh that was the 50s for you um it was it's just about time like i don't know is there really anything else that needs to be said? 
a good step. I completely agree. Something long overdue. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they do something live when we can actually attend games again so mm. we can actually get honored uh, by fans and get a standing ovation and everything like that. Uh, but yeah, it's, just, it's good to see that we're starting to make more strides towards equality and not being totally white in this sport. Um, but final comment before we do our main topic uh, of the podcast, which I I say main topic. We've basically done a main topic this entire time. But uh, Eugene, I mentioned earlier, being Eugene... Uh, he issued a proposal to the Ontario government to host 6,000 fans at games like an hour before we went into a more severe lockdown, because of course he did. Uh, yeah. What is there to say to this? I would say this doesn't even rank in the top five of tone death things, Eugene. <laughs> this is, this is nothing. This is, this is just a lie. The day at the office, I said, there's a lot <laughs> worse stuff that Eugene Olick has done, you know. Um, obviously, you know, it, this one I can almost a- excuse because how is he supposed to know, like, that they were going to announce a more severe lockdown about an hour later? Like, he's got no knowledge of that. This was but, known. We knew um, about this lockdown since, like, last week. Like, we knew we were going to go more severe yeah, than a week I, ago. Come on. I like. Yeah, I don't know. I can I, I can almost excuse it slightly just because there was no official thing from the government yet. But uh, I don't know, Eugene Malik, man, that's that, that's Eugene Malik for you. That's pretty much all you can say. Yep. Aiden, any thoughts on Mr. Malik and? Not really. Whatever he decided to do. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's just it's just Eugene being Eugene, I guess, like you said, Connor. And uh, I don't think his plan's gonna happen anytime soon. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's just another ridiculous statement. That's all. All right, let's move on from the Ottawa Senators. Instead, I want to do a bit of a prediction, and I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, as <laughs> Aiden. <laughs> We made fun of Aiden before the show, or at least I did, uh, because he didn't list his prediction in the doc where I told him to list his predictions. And I scroll up now, and all uh, of a sudden, all yeah, of his predictions are there. Let me just explain. Uh, like, I, I looked, I opened the document, I saw that thing there with, with my name and your name and Nick's name, and I was like, okay, he's probably going to want me to put my predictions, but, like, why am I going to tell him, like, in advance? I'll, I'll surprise him with my picks, and then... I don't know, you guys are doing the soccer segment, I got bored, and I just put put them in there. I, you know what? I, I, I looked at the document in advance. I'm prepared for this show, man. <laughs> all right, all right, I trust you. Um, ooh, we have some interesting debates coming up. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with... Let's finish with the North Division, because that's the one that matters to all three of us. Uh, and instead, we will start with the what do we want to start with let's start with the central because i feel like i'm gonna get in an argument with you too um i guess i'll go first and then we can go down the list based on how i set the document up um which is a next then nick uh i my predictions we did our top four because that is the playoff teams uh my prediction for the central division is the carolina hurricanes will finish in first Tampa Bay Lightning will finish in second, Dallas Stars in third, and the Florida Panthers in fourth. I mean, I'm not saying that it's a bad prediction. Like, obviously, I I agree. Like those those four. I'm also not saying it's good. No, I don't disagree with it that much. Like, obviously, Carolina <laughs> is a very good team. They could be flip flopped oh. with with Tampa. What I put, I guess we can talk about mine. I put Tampa is first, Carolina second, Florida third, and Dallas fourth. I think Dallas is really going to struggle without Sagan, without Bishop. I know Kudobin was great in the playoffs. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know if he can hold up being a, a number one guy for them right off the bat. Um, and obviously Dallas played in the Stanley Cup final they might be a bit slow right out of the gate as well 
So I, I see them just barely sneaking in. I don't see them, you know, beating a team like the Panthers or, or the Blue Jackets like Nick put. I disagree with that, too. I don't think the Jackets have any chance of making it. Um, but I, I don't really disagree with Connor that much. Yeah, no, um, I, I'm okay with putting the Hurricanes number one, to be honest. I like the Hurricanes a lot on paper. Um, I think really the only reason why I didn't put uh, the Hurricanes at first, I put Tampa Bay back there. It's just I, I've got no more reason left to doubt the Tampa Bay Lightning. They have proven everything to everybody. Um, and I can't, in good faith, put them anywhere but first until I see anything otherwise. Um, you know, Carolina and Dallas both there. I think Dallas will be fine, um, just because this is probably still one of the weaker divisions um, that there are. I think the only guarantees are Tampa and Carolina. I, I did put the Blue Jackets fourth again because um, you know, they, they'll battle it out with the Panthers for that. I just don't like the Panthers' defense uh, enough. I need to see Bobrovsky have a bounce back year or any indication that he's going to be better before I can put them back in the playoff spot. But it'll be a close. That's why I had Florida coming in fourth because mm-hmm. Sergey Bobrovsky is exactly like Pekarine in that he has one absolutely terrible year where you think he's never going to be good again and then immediately follows it up with a Vesna candidate. Yeah. Last year, he was one of the worst goalies in the NHL. This year, I think he's going to bounce back like crazy. Mm-hmm. I think he will too. I think I could right, be completely wrong. Right now, he hasn't been practicing with the Panthers. But. He's day to day, but I'm sure you know once he gets in back into game form, I do think that he's going to be an elite goalie this year. I don't see him having two back to back years. I think there was a lot of pressure on him last year. Big, big contract, and you know, coming to a new organization, it does take some time to get adjusted to things. Um, I think. The Panthers have done a great job over the offseason to add to their team. Radko Gudis on the back end. Uh, a, a sneaky signing was Anthony Duclair. Uh, Barkov and Huberto are only going to get better. Um, I really like their team. I definitely think they'll make the playoffs this year. I put them at, where did I put them? Number three. I put them before the Stars. Um, and yeah, I'm going to stick with that. I, I do think that the Panthers could uh, honestly maybe even move up to two at some point. I think they'll be battling with, with the Hurricanes all year. Yeah. Potentially. I I think Carolina's going to be really good. Goaltending still scares me. Um, but hopefully they figure that out. Because uh, their, their back end is insane. The uh, reason I put Tampa second was simply because they don't have Nikita Kucherov. True. And I think losing him is huge for them. Uh, but, again, I could be completely wrong. They get a full year of Blake Coleman, uh, which is huge. Uh, they get a full another year for uh, Nick. <laughs> Nick just switched cameras. <laughs> yep. um, That's full year. Barclay Goudreau? Of Barclay Goudreau, yes. Uh, full four year of Andre Vasilevsky de- uh, developing. Because he's still very young. Great in points. Uh, so we saw what he could do in the Braden playoffs. Point. Yeah. Hard to doubt. Hard to doubt them. Yeah. Yeah, I that was a tough division for me, but next division was borderline even more tough. Uh, which is the East Division. I went with Washington finishing first. I have the Boston Bruins finishing second. Philadelphia Flyers finishing third. And fourth, I have the New York Rangers. So no Pittsburgh Penguins for me. Counting not against Crosby and Malkin, but against everybody else on that team. Because there's nobody else. Uh, that's debatable. Jason Zucker, Tristan Jari, can't count on Jari, Jake Gensel, a healthy Jake Gensel. Tristan, yeah. I wouldn't be counting out Pittsburgh ever. I think they're in the same territory as Tampa. You can't count them out yet. And they they how how many years have they made the playoffs for? Since like early two thousands, I don't see this year being that year. I think they beat out the Rangers for the final spot. Um, I put Boston at three. I think they're gonna struggle though. They might not even make it. I I definitely think Pittsburgh is is more of a lock than 
than both Boston or the Rangers because I, I say the Rangers and Bruins have more question marks. Um, and Connor, like you said, Crosby and Malkin, like even if it's just them two, they can they can just lead your team, even if it's just them. But I, I do I do see where you guys are coming from though. Nick, what are your picks? Yeah, so I've got the Philadelphia Flyers in first place in the division. I think Carter Hart is due for a Vesna-esque season. Um, I talked about this a lot on my own show. Um, I think he's going to have a monster year, and I think it's going to carry them. Their lineup is very balanced, and I think that's going to lead them to charge up the division. The Bruins I have in second for the same reason I do the Tampa Bay Lightning first in the Central I've got no reason ever to doubt the Boston Bruins. Yes, they're coming into the season a little bit banged up, pretty injured, but I still like a lot of the pieces they have on their team depth-wise, and I think they've got the best, some of the best depth in the NHL. Always Tuka Rask is a great. They've got one of the best tandems in Tuka Rask and Yarhalak, and I think Charlie McAvoy um, having a bit more freedom on this team, not being constricted by guys like Zdeno Chara. And having the keys to do what he can is going to lead them. Uh, it's going to make them better, in fact. Capitals in third, longstanding good. And uh, the Rangers in fourth. I think it's going to be between them and Pittsburgh. But I think the Rangers, um, you know, based on goaltending, are going to be good. Yeah, I agree with that. It's mm-hmm. Again, I my big issue with Pittsburgh is they're relying on two goalies have only had one good season and Tristan Jari and Casey DeSmith hasn't even had a good season he's been a backup no, that's um, right. they acquired Kasperi Kapanen to play on Crosby's wing and it is very proven that uh, Kapanen doesn't work on star players wings uh, as evidence with him playing with Perez and Matthews just didn't work um I just don't think Pittsburgh are what they used to be. I I don't like counting it against Pittsburgh, but I just don't think they have built a very good team. I think Jim Rutherford has ruined the Pittsburgh Penguins kind. Really? Like You can't say yeah. that because he, he won them the two tops. He was the GM that brought in Kessel, that brought in Hagelin, Benito, yeah. all those guys. But um I yeah. I like the captain. Still a good GM, but yeah, I like how they got Kapanen. I don't like what they gave up. Um, I think, you know, last year they were lacking a little bit of speed in their lineup, but I think, you know, Zucker helped towards the end of the year, um, and Kapanen's definitely going to help a lot with, with that. Um, but there were also some questionable moves. Like, I don't like the Cody CC signing, obviously. Mike Matheson isn't the best defenseman. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see how, how that works out. Um... But I, I just—I like, was going to say, in my experiences, and I guess now both of yours, a team with Cody CC doesn't win anything. Yeah, fair and enough. That's why they won't. A team with Cody CC and uh, Eric Goodbranson playing on the same defensive pair. Wait, is he gone or is he still there? Is going to be. Eric Goodbranson is an Ottawa was, senator was, now. Oh. Or not? Yeah, not Goodbranson. Who is it? No, it is Goodbranson. Matheson. Matheson. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah he got traded from yeah. Anaheim. Matheson. Thank you, Mike mm-hmm. Matheson. Uh, uh, yeah. A pair with Cody CC and Mike Matheson is. I do. Think, I, to be I think. I think Mike Matheson is a bit underrated offensively, though. If if he you know gets a lot of the offensive zone starts, gets some power play time, then I like him as a player. But don't put him on the penalty kill. Don't. I don't trust him in his own zone. But I think offensively he has some upside. And he's, he's only like, what, 25, 26 too? So he can grow. Yes, but you're ignoring the fact that he's playing with Cody CC. Oh, they're not going to put him on the, the same pair, I put... don't think. Will they? <laughs> they better not. They are. Really? They, are. Oh, the they, they were on the same pair. Oh, okay. I, pair. Yeah. I did not know that. That's not good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's putting it nicely. Um, yeah, Pittsburgh could be a very interesting team this season. Although they did get rid of Jack Johnson, so that's a positive. And True. now he's a New York Ranger, so we will see how that goes. Um, defense is clearly not a main piece in the 
Eastern Conference. Eastern Division. I guess. Are we calling them divisions or conferences at this point? I guess divisions, yeah? Divisions. Okay. Well, let's go to the West before we hit the North. Um, my picks, I have the Colorado Avalanche finishing first. The Las... Or not loss, the Vegas Golden Knights finishing second with new, new captain Mark Stone, the St. Louis Blues finishing in third, and the Minnesota Wild coming in fourth. Aiden? Yeah. Um, I like Colorado and Vegas. Like I was flip-flopping between those two who would finish in first. I'll take Vegas strictly just because of the goaltending situation. Robin Leonard and Marc Andre Fleury are probably the best goalie tandem in the league, and we saw what Grubauer could do early last year, and he really solidified himself as a number one. But then towards the end of the year, he kind of slid off a bit, um, and then Pavel Francis isn't you know the best goalie as well, so that's probably the only question mark. But offensively and in that defensive core is pretty stacked still. But you can say the same about Vegas. Their you know forward core has a lot of depth, and their defense is stacked with. Theodore and, and Petrangelo now. They did lose Nate Schmidt, but I think Petrangelo will definitely fill that void and, and do really well in, on the top pair. Um, and then, uh, yeah, St. Louis at three. We all put St. Louis at three. I think that's, you know, where they're going to end up. And then um, you guys put Minnesota at four. I put Arizona at four. I think the Coyotes have a much more talented offense than, than the Wild. The Wild's best player is... Is arguably Kevin Fiala, and the Coyotes seem to have a little bit more depth. You know, Keller, Schmaltz, uh, Phil Kessel, uh, Oliver Ekman Larson on the back end too. And, you know, the, the Wild have a, an aging defensive core. Um, and they got, you know, Ryan Suter and Zach Parise are getting up there. Um, I don't think Minnesota can really score goals. And also in net, the Wild have uh, Cam Talbot. And Capo Kakinen, Capo Kakinen might be very good, but he's very young. So we don't know what's what's going to happen there. And then the Coyotes, they got Darcy Kemper, who's a very good goalie. He played really well last year, best in a caliber before he got hurt. So uh, yeah, I'll take the I'll take the Yotes. And yeah, what about you guys? Why why Minnesota? Well, we, I, think, I have a I little bit of breaking news. Sorry. Oh, yeah. No, I was going to say for Minnesota quickly, I think Kaprizov is the guy we're underrated. True. The impact he can have coming over from the NHL. Okay, fair enough. That's. I was going to say that, but news from this division uh, involving the Vegas Golden Knights. Tomorrow, Kelly McCurran announced that the Golden Knights will go with five defensemen on opening night. Petrangelo, Theodore, McNabb, Martinez, and White Cloud. And they'll go with 13 forwards. Is someone injured, or are they just trying that as a new strategy? No, they're just doing it. Wow. That's just their strategy for this game. Interesting. So, we will... Interesting. Yeah. Could work. Could be absolutely terrible. Uh, but I'm always for weird stuff. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> very, very true. Uh, Nick, who are your picks? Yeah, uh, I went with, uh, I agreed with Aiden. Vegas is going to win the division because I think there's just, I like Colorado's offense and defense more, but they have a question mark in goaltending. I think Vegas answers a lot more questions in that regard with Leonard, um, which was, I think, going to be the get of the offseason. Colorado in second because they're excellent. St. Louis in third because they are also very good and uh, do stand. They, that's where the cutoff at this division really is because it's pretty much a crapshoot from there. And um, I do have Minnesota at four just because I think Caprizov is going to come in. He's going to make a big difference for the Wild. And uh, I, I still like their defense. I think Spurgeon is very good. I still think Suter is reasonably effective. And as long as the goaltending is just league average, I think they will be in the playoffs. All right. Interesting decisions. Uh We've all had pretty much very similar teams, maybe like one swapped out each time. Uh, but our last division, uh, I want to have a very good debate about this because it's going to be interesting to hear both of your opinions. Uh, but my picks for the North Division, 
I have the Toronto Maple Leafs finishing first, the Calgary Flames finishing in second, the Montreal, almost said impact for a second, Canadians finishing third, and the Winnipeg Jets coming in fourth. No Edmonton Oilers. Aiden, who did you pick? Um, I got the Toronto Maple Leafs in first place. Um, I think that's kind of set in stone. But uh, the next one is a shocker, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know how this is a shocker. Like, they could honestly win the division, in my opinion. They're the only team that could compete with Toronto. That's the Vancouver Canucks. They made it to the second round of the playoffs last year. They're hungry for some redemption. Uh, Elias Pettersson, Besser, Horvat, JT Miller, Quinn Hughes. Uh, a sick tandem in net with Demko and Holtby. I really like their team, so I think they're going to finish in, in second place there. Then uh, third place, I got to You can't go against Connor McDavid not making the playoffs. I think, you know, maybe the one question mark for them is, is goalie again. Koskinen and, and Smith, not the strongest goalies at all. But um, I really like their offense still, and I'm not going to go against Dreisaitl and McDavid. And then fourth, uh, I got the Canadians, and that's also maybe risky, um, but Carey Price is still a very good goalie. We saw what he can do in the playoffs last year. Um, I like some of the ads that they made in the offseason. Uh, they still got a great defensive core, Shea Weber, Jeff Petrie, um, and then, um, yeah, th their offense is solid, I think, too. Nick Suzuki is going to step up, Kod Kenyemi is going to step up, and I'm not the biggest Canadians fan, but I think I think they'll do well. They'll make the playoffs. Nick, do you have the right mic selected? What's that? Do you have the right mic selected? How do you mean? I don't know if you have the proper mic selected in Discord. I think you might be using your computer mic as opposed to the... Was there a vacuum going off? It might have just been like really loud and we just caught it. Yeah, I think that's what it was. I think it switched uh, when I had a quick malfunction. Hold on, let me see. Okay. That is better. Hello, hello? Oh, that sounds better. Yes. That better? You had you. Does it sound like that? Yeah, it's, you had the wrong mic selected. Um, yes, I think so. The whole. Uh, so I think yes. my little camera here, hello, that's where the was being captured yes. right now. Here's so my mic. I think that's what's that better? happening. Yeah, that sounds better. I had a feeling that was happening throughout the show, but I didn't want to call you out <laughs> until <laughs> it still, it still sounded up. fine. I, I didn't I didn't really catch that, so but yet yeah, again mine is delayed. Okay. I don't have the best. <laughs> oh um no I was gonna say for the North Division I'll give my picks quickly. Um Toronto finishing one, I think any conversation around who's winning this division really begins with Toronto. It's theirs to lose. Um, Calgary, I have finishing second. I think they're being underrated a bit. I think Jacob Markstrom, when you add a perennial Vesna candidate, is going to take them up that next level, and I think that's a big play for them. Montreal third, they're the most balanced in the division. I think they have the best tandem in the division in Price and Allen, I think. Um, that's going to go a long way with how congested the schedule is this year. And then uh, I have Edmonton in fourth just because I cannot rule out uh, both Dreisaitl and McDavid. Here's where I disagree with you two. Edmonton, I'm not counting out Mr. McDavid or Mr. Dreisaitl. I'm counting out that goaltending tandem mm -hmm. because they're going to have to face Elias Patterson. Patrick Laine, Austin Matthews for 30 games. That's true. But what about right, the other They teams? were fine last year, though. As long as they're league average, I think they'll be fine. I just think that there's... I don't uh, think so. I, I just think that there's a lot of teams that are, that are going to be um, better. Or sorry, worse. Sorry, worse than Edmonton. I think Winnipeg is going to finish a lot worse. Um, I like Hellebuck obviously better than, than Koskinen. He's a very good goalie. But Winnipeg has been struggling. Their offense isn't what it used to be, it seems, and their decor is god awful. Um, even, yeah, I didn't put Calgary. I, I don't think Calgary's going to be that good. Jacob Markstrom, 
he was insane with Vancouver last year. I don't know if it's going to be the same um, situation with, with the Flames. I think he might even turn into like a Bobrovsky in his first year. Um, and then I don't really trust that trio of Gaudreau, Monaghan, and and Lindholm anymore. I, I think one of them has to get traded. I, I think they're due for a bounce back. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. I don't see and them finishing as high as second, second, though. I don't. I don't see there's any way. I really. I'm really interested. Why you guys didn't pick Vancouver to not make it at all? Because they don't have any goalies. I, they I don't have any Vancouver goalies. Vancouver has yeah. no goalies. I, I said this. To Luke. What that do you mean? That was unproven. Yeah, Brady I don't think I, it's been terrible over the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I think I think the goaltending is a clear downgrade. I think it, it it I think it's arguably the worst tandem in the division. Um, along with Ottawa's, I think I don't like their defense on paper outside of Hughes, and their bottom six is a disaster for me. Wow, okay, that, my thoughts are completely against all of that. I'm with Luke, I guess. I think Vancouver is going to be a scary team. I could see them competing with Toronto for the number one spot. I think you guys are miscounting out the fact that this team went the farthest in the playoffs out of all the Canadian teams. They have experience. They want some redemption. Elias Pettersson has proven they himself did. to be a great they did player that with in the league. Jacob Markstrom, though. Not really. Thatcher Demko scored, stole the show against uh, against Vegas in that series. What, two shutouts in a row? And then he put up a great performance in Game 7 as well. I think Demko is going to be a great goalie this year, and I think Holtby is a safe backup um, in limited starts, too. You know, he, he was overworked in, in Washington. They didn't have a backup to go to. I think it's going to be a, a really good split. I think it's going to work out, but we'll see. We'll see. It's a very Hope open. He wasn't the starter last year. I'm saying over his career in Washington, he was overworked. And last year, yeah, he 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 was the starter last year. Samsonov didn't play all the games. Played most of them though. I wouldn't like, say that. I think no. you're you're putting a lot of bank into a game into a seven game series in a bubble on Thatcher Demko, and you're putting a lot of weight into that. I think you're discounting the fact that Vancouver weren't an amazing team during the season, and if they lose Pedersen, they're done. Okay, but I you think could say the same like, thing about like another. You could say the same thing about Edmonton, or the same thing about you know uh, Calgary. Exactly. If they lose one player, it's it's done. If they stay healthy, Vancouver's offense is sick, and their power play is lethal still. I don't know. I disagree. I, I would, think. Vancouver it, isn't going to be the best. I there's think no way Edmonton they miss out on the Edmonton's going to struggle because they have no back end. Edmonton have no defense, period. Oscar Clefbon is done for the season. So they're done. Like, I don't think they'll be very good. Um, it'll be the McDavid drive side will show again. And I don't think in a division as stacked as this, they're going to have what it takes to push enough games in their favor to make the playoffs. I could see them sneaking in the four seed. I just don't think they could do it. Winnipeg, I was torn on because obviously Line A wants it out, but he's wanted out for two seasons now, and that has not been an issue as of yet. Um, and they also have Connor Hellebuck, who is a Vesna winner. Um, I think. Yeah, he won the Vesna last year, right? Yes. I think so, yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Did did they, they did even play hockey last year? Like it feels like it's so long ago. Yeah, that's a good point. In fairness for you, it was pretty much a year ago. It's um, it's been ten months now. So yeah. yikes. Yeah. Uh, so you think? Just think about that. It's only been ten months since all this stuff started. It feels like it's been ten years. <laughs> um, but we're getting back to normal. So stay positive, people. Uh, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yes, getting vaccinated soon. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, but yeah, I think Toronto is going to be the best team. I think Montreal could be sneaky good. I think the tandem's insane. I think their back end is really good. Uh, they've got crazy depth on the wing. Center scares me. I don't know how good their center depth is, but I think they could be very good. I think they could grind you really hard. I think the Sens could be. An underrated, annoying team. They're going to be terrible, but they could be very, very annoying. Um, yeah, they got some so. sick jerseys. So, though. 
Oh, I, they'll be terrible, but they'll look good doing <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. So that's fine. That's that's all we care about. They look good doing it because their advanced analytics are terif- are just terrifying. Uh, but their eye test is great. Um, yeah, it's the North Division is such a toss up. There are six teams who can make the playoffs. Honestly, sorry. No, <laughs> no, very no wide offense. open. It's very wide open. No, I know. <laughs> Trust me, I know. <laughs> What's it going to take for um, Ottawa to make look, the playoffs got... this year, Nick? Tim Stutzla needs to be Connor McDavid V2. All right. Tim Stutzla wins a Calder. Drake Batherson become, scores as much as he did in the AHL. Brady Kachuk scores at least 20, 25 goals. Matt Murray posts a like 930 save percentage. Oh, and... And Nikita Zaitsev and oh Eric Good Branson get left behind at an airport somewhere. That's what it takes. That's, what it takes. Uh, that's good. That's the only way they'll make the playoffs, but uh, I, I'm not confident in all those things happening. But who knows? Uh, if you told me a year ago that uh, there'd be a pandemic, I would have said you're insane. So, you know, crazier stuff's happened. Yeah. Three, in, three teams, serious injuries. Montreal, Louis McDavid. Montreal lose Price. Did I just say Montreal twice? Edmonton lose McDavid. Montreal lose Price. Yeah. Um, and Vancouver lose Pedersen. Ottawa could be in the running there, honestly. Uh, but no, there are a lot of things that need to go right in order for that to happen. Uh, which yeah. the odds of that happening are very slim. But it's going to. I'm not. I'm not betting on it. It's going to be a crazy season. You're officially three hours and twenty minutes away. From uh, puck drop between the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Montreal Canadiens, uh, it's it's gonna be crazy. Um, do any of you? Oh, actually, I want to do this finally before we do our hot take segment, which we didn't tell Nick about because we never do and we always forget. Um, but I have one prepared so I can talk for a bit of time before you <laughs> uh, or make something up. Um, I want to know who is going to be your prediction for the Stanley Cup final and who wins it this season. I'll go first so that you guys can think. Tough. Um, Tough. I will say this leads into my hot take. Toronto Maple Leafs and Colorado Avalanche in the Stanley Cup final. Is that possible? I don't know if that's possible. Is Isn't it, it? I think it's because uh, the divisions are messed up this year. I think the Leafs are playing um, either the uh, they're playing the, either the East or or the Central. I think in the final. Well, Colorado or in the West. Oh, they're playing them in the final. Yeah. So okay. so they could play the Abs in the conference final, but I don't believe it's the final. So there's a chance. That the Leafs could play the Bruins in the Stanley Cup final. Interesting. It was four one in the <laughs> Stanley Cup final. I would love it. I might kill myself. That would <laughs> so bad. I don't think I could handle Twitter after that would happen. Now, now I, um, I think that's how it works. Sportsnet put out like a uh, playoff simulation thing today, and yeah, the Leafs are playing okay. like. Uh, the Avalanche, the Vegas Golden Knights, the Blues, the Kings in the conference final up and up until the conference final. Kings. They they put the Kings in as like a it was they did like an NHL twenty one playoff simulation and the Kings made it as I guess the eighth seed. Yeah. Did they just <laughs> discover John Jonathan Quick could play again? Yeah, he's still probably like, like rated what, eighty five, eighty four? He's got the poise. You know, it's the poise. It's like a 99 poise. Oh, he needs to be a 99 if they want to make the playoffs. Because that team sucks. I wonder what Quinton Byfield's um, rated. Maybe he's rated pretty high. Even though he's not making the team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, well, in that case, because it can't be Toronto versus Colorado, I will go with Toronto against the Carolina Hurricanes. I really wish we were playing like the Avalanche or, or Vegas, right. but 
I shouldn't complain. If we make it to the Stanley Cup final, who cares who we play? Yeah. Um, Nick, have Nick, you got yeah. yours? Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've got, like, no idea who's going to play who in the playoffs. I'll go with Tampa Bay and Colorado, yes, and I hope that can happen. According to Aiden. Uh, yes, Tampa Bay and Colorado c- right. could work. And that's actually what Sportsnet predicted with the NHL 21 simulation. Colorado, Tampa. Oh, I should I say, Tampa Bay goes back I to think back. Tampa Bay repeats. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do I say? I, I got to stick with the Leafs because that was my hot take last week. Leafs will win the cup. And I'm going to say the Flyers. And I really hate the Flyers. So if, if, gosh, Leafs, please, this has to be the year. I can't, I can't stand it. If the Flyers beat the Leafs in the Stanley Cup final, I would not be able to do it. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting, but we'll wrap up the show with our hot takes segment. Uh, if you're not familiar with the show, at the end of each show, we do a segment called Hot Takes, where we make a prediction about the world of sports. So as Aiden referenced earlier in the show, um, he's predicted Babcock getting fired within two weeks. And <laughs> he was fired within two weeks. Um, I've predicted in the past that MLB would be the first league back in early June, and they were the last league to come back. Um, so we're either incredibly right, in Aiden's case, or incredibly wrong in all of my picks ever. I guess I'll go first and give you guys some time to think, because I have one sort of prepared. Although, basing it off of Aiden's last week, it's not that hot. My prediction is that a Canadian team breaks the streak for years without a Stanley Cup in Canada. I think it'll be a Canadian team. Nice. Fair, yeah. fair. Uh, I'm going to go with the Vancouver Canucks do get out with the Ottawa Senators, and Vancouver ends up with a top three pick in the NHL draft in 2021. Wow, that's extremely hot. That is hot. steaming hot. Especially because I think Vancouver could wow. maybe win the cup. <laughs> 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 Hot take swapped. <laughs> Nick predicts bottom three. Aiden predicts Stanley Cup champion. Yeah, literally. But no, I just said the Leafs would make it to the Stanley Cup final, so I can't say Vancouver now. Um, I'll say Pittsburgh. Well, you just you got thirty one weeks. You can do thirty one picks, and you'll be right eventually. Fair enough. Fair enough. I will say the Pittsburgh Penguins make it to the conference final this year. Oh. Yeah. Fair. Fair. Yeah, and then they'll lose to uh, like that. their Pennsylvania rivals in the Flyers, and the Leafs will have to to win in the in the final end and stick up for the Penguins a little bit there. <laughs> wow! All right. Well, that is our show for this week. Yeah. Thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, Nick, thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been a ton Thanks for having of fun. me on, guys. Uh, all two hours 45 minutes of it um, we really appreciate it obviously our shows are very long which we're working on shortening them down but we figured we'd do extra long this week or I figured we'd do extra long this week because hockey restarts so spent a bit of time on that um, it's a good, good cause yeah. it is, it is. Uh, time flew by today we don't know when we'll be yeah we don't know when we'll be back next week uh, because classes restart maybe a week off. Uh, I'm still trying to finalize my schedule for classes uh, because that hasn't been done yet. Um, but we will let you know on our social medias or we'll just appear again in your YouTube feed, which speaking of your YouTube feed, subscribe to us. Hit that bell so you get notifications for when we upload. Although we shouldn't really get hit by YouTube at all because we have 18 subscribers. Yeah, um, well, my, uh, my Nick, friend, my friend who does have his post notifications on he sent me a message today, uh, the screenshot of where it says Nick Nick Robinson, uh, the big league. And he was just like, oh my gosh, I thought this said Nick Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was just like, yeah, maybe, maybe I should change it to that. I'm going to have more that viewers. guy around my name for the rest of my career. <laughs> yeah. Po- yeah, probably. Um, but yes, yeah, so we'll link all of your stuff down below, everything. Um we really appreciate you coming on. We can't wait to see what you do with your new podcast, uh, who just followed me back on Twitter. 
uh, four man advantage. Uh, so shout out to you guys for restarting that. Um, everything will be linked down below apart from his Facebook. So you don't have to go through and scroll through every post he made in 2014. Um, but <laughs> with that, thank you for listening. We will see you next time. Enjoy the hockey tonight and don't invade the Capitol building. Peace. Oh,